the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Marty is Marty Bloom is not here today. She's in Portland at the Mayor's Design Institute, and she's asked me in her little note here to have fun. <laughs> so I'll in invite all of you to do the same. Uh, first, we'll look and see if there's any public comment before we start a meeting today. And uh, Mr. Mayor Armstrong? Nunn, Mayor Pro Tem House. Okay, and any changes to our agenda? Nope. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. This is about the budget, and we're going to be hearing from two departments today, Public Works and Community Development. Um, we've got a couple hours if we need it for Public Works, and we'll take a short break and then come back for Community Development. And um, I see Mr. Casey there. All right. Okay. I think Jill Tara, the budget manager, has okay. a couple comments to make. Okay. Ms. Tara. I wish it's good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem and members of council. Jill Tara, budget manager. And I just wanted to introduce the item today. This represents the uh, second public hearing and budget work session on the review of the recommended operating and capital budget for fiscal year 2009. We opened the public hearing on the budget at the last work session, which was April 25th. Today is the second. And as you mentioned, We'll be hearing presentations from the Public Works, Community Development, and RDA staff on their proposed budgets for 09. And I wanted to mention that our next two upcoming um, public hearings will be on May 7th, I'm, I'm sorry, May 12th, and May 14th, where we'll wrap up the department presentations. Thank you. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Casey. Okay, Mr. Casey. Good afternoon, Mr. Pro Tem House. Ready to have fun? Council members, exactly. I was All right. Say, that's good. Public Works, the Department of Fun. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for laughing. Uh, real briefly, just uh, this is the organization chart of the Public Works Department. It's a very large and, and complicated department, and uh, this kind of gives you a, a schematic overview of it, with the major sections being and divisions being facilities, engineering, streets and transportation water resources, and the administration section and motor pool. You'll notice down on the bottom right-hand corner, solid waste and environmental services. Those are currently being managed by the finance department, and you'll hear about those programs on Monday as part of the finance department presentation uh, in that. Thirteen funds, five divisions, 36 programs, over 300 full-time equivalent employees. So it's a very large and wide-ranging uh, department. Key staff with me today that I want to recognize, and you'll see them come up as we talk about each of the different funds. Pat Kelly, the Assistant Director and City Engineer. Rebecca Bjork could not be here today. She's the Acting Water Resources Manager. In her stead, we have John Schof and Kathy Taylor, who are the uh, Wastewater Systems Manager and the Water Systems Manager, respectively. Uh, we have Brennan Allen, Transportation Manager. Jim Dewey, Facilities and Energy Manager. Bill McTomney is our administrative officer and, and real budget guru, unfortunately. He's not here today, uh, and that's why I'm making Jill Torres stick around. So uh, any of the hard questions will go her way. That's a heads up for her. And then Kathy Kiefhofer, uh really helps putting the budget together, especially on the performance management side and also uh, with the presentation today. So I want to thank Kathy for that. And in addition, we have Gary Horwald in the, off in the uh, audience today. He's our motor pool superintendent, so we'll be able to answer any questions in that regard. Presentation outline. Because it is such a large department uh, with a wide scope, we're going to go by fund, which follows the budget document that you have in front of you and that's available online. We'll talk about significant budget changes, a, a heads up. There aren't a lot of significant budget changes. Um, because it is the second year of a two-year financial plan, we have made some, but, but nothing of, of real major in scope. We'll talk about key performance objectives, some significant projects. There is a lot going on in the department that I think you'll find of interest. And then thought I would pause after each fund and answer questions at that point rather than waiting for the entire uh, department presentation. And so we'll kind of break it into chunks that way and go from there. Real briefly, this is just the, the scope of the funds that we'll be going through today uh, in order. And let's just get moving on. General fund. Uh, the general fund is actually a relatively small portion of the Public Works Department. Uh, it includes administration, engineering services is the largest chunk of the general fund, and land development. Environmental services is part of the general fund portion of the budget, and again, that will be covered by the Finance Department as they're the ones managing that program at this point. Uh, just real briefly, a pie chart, just kind of showing the breakdown of the general fund, uh, and again, engineering services, which are the project engineers and support staff that are really running the capital program, as well as the land development services, and then a smaller chunk for environmental services and administration. 
The budget changes to help address the uh, general fund budget issues. Uh, as you are well aware, each of the general fund departments was asked to make reductions. And for the public works portion of the general fund, we're able to meet fully our, our reduction targets of about $203,000 on the operations side uh, by reducing one of the project engineer positions that became vacant, so holding that vacant, reducing supplies and services, and then increasing the street permit fee revenue estimate uh, based upon ongoing trends of the actual revenue we are seeing in that fund. We're not really projecting a growth in the actual revenue, but we're budgeting more accurately what that revenue is, which it has historically the last couple of years come in higher than what we were budgeting, and so we're just readjusting that to help meet our target. Uh, we are going to be uh, increasing our public works engineering fees by a, a standard cost of living increase essentially of about 4%. And then on the capital side, the general fund capital side, making a couple adjustments, again, to help with the overall reduction target. And these were the ADA improvements, accessibility improvements, and sustainability improvements were put into the general fund capital for the first time as part of this two-year budget. Uh, they were put in as kind of plug numbers to help us as an ongoing basis address these needs as a city. Uh, and as such, there wasn't a magic to the $250,000 number, uh, $250, number for the ADA improvements. And so we're recommending adjusting that to $200,000, which again, though, we hope will be an ongoing effort towards ADA improvements and perhaps as budget, uh, budgets improve, might be able to increase that over time. And then the sustainability improvements, uh, reducing that from $125,000 to $100,000, However, as you'll see later in the presentation, we're being very successful working with Edison and getting other grant money to really help us on our energy efficiency efforts. And so I think our overall effort and sustainability improvements is going to be much enhanced. Uh, and so we felt that gave us a little flexibility to, to touch a little off on the general fund capital side in that regard. Some key performance objectives for the general fund. Uh, you know, it's mostly the capital that's the big uh, item, but we also will be tracking the energy annual energy used in all of our public works facilities. Uh, we're going to try to limit the change order cost to the value of the project to less than 9%. That's trying to do good cost estimating and then holding contractor the scope of work. Uh, we're including construction and demolition recycling requirements in all city projects and creating the specifications to implement that. And then, of course, a slurry seal and asphalt concrete pavement overlay uh, construction contract and managing that. But again, I think the more significant effort from the general fund fund standpoint is the capital improvement program. And so that is uh, continuing to oversee the design, development, construction of capital projects. And essentially, the engineering <coughs> team serves as support to the rest of the city organization. Uh, and so all the other departments you will see also addressing capital program. This is the support staff in that regard. And then uh, as part of the next two-year budget cycle, we're going to be developing a new five-year capital improvement program. And so that'll be the FY10 to FY15 capital improvement program. And so that kind of lays out the long-term vision of where we're going as a city with regards to making important infrastructure improvements. And then this slide just kind of shows uh, some of the scope of projects we have going out. It is the busiest time that we have had as a city with regards to capital construction from all the different funds. And so that is exciting and challenging at the same time. Scheduled for completion next fiscal year will be the fire station number one seismic improvements, which you recently awarded the contract for. The East Cabrillo sidewalks are just beginning construction now, so that will be completed. Mission Street at Highway 101, uh, those, those changes there are under construction now and will be completed next fiscal year, as well as we expect the West Downtown pedestrian improvements to get under construction and completed as part of next fiscal year. Scheduled to begin construction next year, uh, the big one, of course, is the airline terminal. Very exciting that that is going to begin construction. Uh, the consolidated rental car facility out at the airport, the Korea Recreation Center will begin construction. The Haley De La Vina Street Bridge replacement will begin in construction, and uh, of course, we'll do our annual pavement maintenance program as well. And then coming down the pike a little bit later, but doing all the design work and preparatory work during next year's budget will be the Cabrillo Bridge at Mission Creek. Uh, very complicated project. You know, let's just replace a bridge, sounds easy, but uh, you have some challenges working over a creek with some neighboring property owners with real property issues. You've got Rusty's pizza, pizza, which is actually technically connected to the bridge. And so how do you deal with that when you're taking the bridge out and what goes back in? Uh, Cater Water Advanced Treatment uh, will be in design. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. The Jake Boisel Bikeway over near Highway 154 will be in design. And then we didn't know how Mr. to. Mr. Chair. Yes, we have a question here. Yes, 
recently um, we were a couple of us were um, were shown the uh, the water I guess drainage facility at this point that you're talking about where the um, the gates open into Mission Creek and it was uh, discussed this this was the owner of the home improvement center that we needed to replace um, another motor down there um, is that what we're talking about no, here? No, no, not not what we're talking. What you're talking about is the Laguna Channel yes. and the pump station there, uh, which Mr. Kelly is very actively in working on improvements that we sometimes fund through the Streets Fund and get grant money, and we can talk about that if you have questions about its status. But I'm not sure that the Cater Water Advanced Treatment is up at the Cater Water Treatment Plant, uh, and so that's trying to meet uh, oncoming federal regulations for water quality and improving the water treatment. And then the lower Mission Creek Phase One is the Mission Creek Flood Control Project. But, but wouldn't that project that we're talking about be in the lower Creek Flood Control area because it's it floods the you know the lower part of the Santa it's Barbara. Laguna Creek, not Mission Creek. The pump station is the pump station of is Laguna. Laguna Channel. I mean, you're correct in that they both feed into the the lagoon, the Mission Creek Lagoon. There, uh, technically, we're looking at them as two separate projects. The Mission Creek Flood Control Project is being permitted and approved and and trying to be funded and constructed separately from the Laguna Channel uh, pump station, which is really kind of an isolated issue that then tries to drain out the Laguna Channel, which does go up to the Haley Gutierrez corridor in that regard mm -hmm. as well. But Mr. Casey, we don't see the Laguna uh, pump station on this list here, do we? I mean, Excuse me? It's the, the Laguna pump station, the Laguna Channel, is not here no. on this list. No. Um, and I think that's the question. The question is, why isn't it on this capital program list? You know, and I'll be honest, because this is just a snapshot of some of the larger projects. If we did all of the capital projects, uh, we'd have a very long and extensive we're going we're gonna to change my microphone. Okay. So if you can hold on a second. Yeah, Mr. Kelly, um, you, were, you were just about to, to um, put a word in. Um, you got a good mic there for you? Okay, good. Uh, just uh, while we're waiting. This for us, yes. Yes, we had a hard time. Um, Mr. Uh, um, Mayor, Tim, uh, yeah. Mayor. <laughs> Uh, house Mr. Mayor, is that there is a, uh, a long list of capital improvement projects. In fact, we have about 84 that are active, and so the um, replacement of an installation of new motors at the Laguna pump station uh, is scheduled to be uh, completed prior to this coming uh, winter. Uh, but it, it's uh, an active list, just not on this uh, brief list. Got it. This is this list is a, is is hitting the hitting the top of the exactly. of the larger list. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Go ahead. And the, the final comment on this page that I wanted to make was the Lower Mission Creek Flood Control Project, which we kind of put in design, but in reality, it's kind of all over the place. As you know, we came and gave you a briefing and talked about our new approach towards implementing the flood control project, not waiting for the federal government and the Corps of Engineers to fund it as one project. Instead, we're going to incrementally try to build it as opportunities come up. We have some constructions over the rail road bridge, getting the culvert in, that's going to happen in the next couple months, hopefully. Uh, we just received some grant funding through uh, the state grant program for a million dollars that will help fund a little chunk of it. And so we're just going to incrementally keep plugging away on that flood control project. And so really it would, could be in all three columns if we wanted to look at it that way. So that in a snapshot is kind of the quick look at the general fund of the department. Uh, again, it's fairly limited in scope. Happy to answer any additional questions or I can keep moving forward. Any uh, questions right now? Okay, let's carry on. So the streets fund will be our next fund. And so we'll talk about that. This just gives you a quick understanding of the four main sections of the streets fund, utilities undergrounding, Transportation Development Act, which helps fund a lot of alternative transportation items, the streets capital on, on funding slurry seals and that sort, and the street sweeping as well. This is kind of a summary of how we fund our streets program, and I'll talk about it more at the end of this section as well. But as you can see, a good chunk of our streets fund for the upcoming fiscal years from capital grants, which is great. This is kind of one-time grant money we'll be able to get in and to help fund a lot of our streets programs, but it's not reliable ongoing funding. And so the remainder of the, of the pie chart here is kind of your ongoing funding, which is Measure D. 
uh, street sweeping revenues, a little bit of undergrounding utilities, and then the utility users tax and the state gas tax that we get. And so that is the chunk that is more reliable and ongoing, and that there are a couple of uh, voting issues that are coming up that uh, those revenues are in jeopardy, and we'll talk about that and what the impact of that might be. Budget changes for the streets fund. We've adjusted for the grants that we got, the biggest one being the Proposition 1B that the voters of California passed just a year or two ago, getting about $1.4 million for that, and that will really help to beef up and enhance our pavement management program. And also just an adjustment to the bridge grant program for the Haley D. Lavina project to reflect the, the more accurate cost as we get further along in the design. And so that's just a budget change, but really doesn't have any impact on our ability to complete that project. And then to help, again, uh, balance the general fund issue in the street sweeping fund, which initially was in the general fund, but then kind of got created into the streets budget over the last few years or so. When we started the street sweeping uh, budget, we weren't sure how much revenue we would collect from the different sources, especially the parking citation revenue and so over the first five years or so we've established a pretty healthy reserve fund which we don't think is really necessary to the level that we had it in the streets fund and so we felt very comfortable in returning five hundred thousand dollars of that to the general fund as kind of one-time money to help with the budget situation and we also think on an ongoing basis as we add our final street sweeping section coming up uh, in July in San Roque that we're going to be pretty well balanced based upon the revenues and the cost of the program going forward Forward, such that we don't feel we're going to be accruing another large chunk of reserves in that fund. And so we think this is a prudent one-time return to the general fund, and then we think we're going to be pretty well on balance going forward from that point on. Now we have two questions for you, uh, Mr. Horton and then uh, Ms. Schneider. Paul, I'm looking at, at D92 in the, in the small book. Am I in the right place? Um, I'm wondering, um, there's a fairly significant decrease in the miles of streets receiving asphalt pavement, you know, it would, it would seem that the, the need would be the same year to year. So are we just doing doing it less frequently or you see what I'm looking at here? Yes, but which uh, which performance measure are you looking I'm at? I'm looking at lane miles of city streets to receive asphalt pavement treatment, which is right down the middle of that right. chart. Correct. John Awazak, do you want to come up and answer that question? John Awazak is our principal engineer in charge of the street surfacing project and streets funds. Mr. Awazak. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Councilmember Horton. It is true that we have um, le applying less treatment to our roads, and that's primarily due to the increase of the, the cost for the treatment. As you well know, that the materials cost for pavement materials, including slurry seal, have uh, skyrocketed in the last few years. And so um, with the monies that have historically been budgeted for this, for this pavement maintenance item, uh, we have uh, not been able to maintain as, as many lane miles as we have historically. However, this next fiscal year 09, we do have a significant more um, amount of money that's been allocated or uh, proposed for the budget for pavement maintenance. And of course, future funding is dependent on future uh, revenue sources. But uh, for example, this year is about $2 million. Next year is about $3.5 million. And in the last two years, we've had asphalt prices raise over 50%. And so that's the reason for the decrease. Okay, well, that makes sense. A follow-up question to that, which is a, a neighborhood issue. Those of us that live on concrete streets, nothing has been done for quite a while. Is, is that just never going to happen, so we should just patch it ourselves, or what, what's the program here? Councilmember Horton, it's an excellent observation that, that it hasn't been treated for a long time, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is that treatment for concrete... My shock absorbers uh, observe it for me. <laughs> the, the, the concrete streets are more costly to maintain. Generally speaking, they are in uh, good stru structural condition. Their aesthetics and their rideability um, are not the most pleasing. However, um, we are exploring with treatments for concrete streets. That's something that slurry seal hasn't been able to cost effectively maintain in the past. However, with the advancement of petroleum products and pavement materials, we are this next fiscal year planning to treat the three blocks of, uh, of Carrillo from um, San, um, Santa Barbara Street, the three blocks towards the school. And we're going to be trying some innovative uh, ways to treat that concrete. And if successful, we would like to try and apply that money uh, budget allowing on other pavement streets to give some relief to those uh, 
those residents and neighborhoods who have concrete streets. However, historically, it hasn't been cost effective to do that with our slurry seal program. So yeah, I, I, I think we all get that in the neighborhood, but I guess it, really the, the specific question is, is it never going to get done? Or at some point, is something going to get done? Council Member Horton, we're going to try uh, in this next year, we're going to try some treatments to, to address concrete streets to see if it can be cost effectively done with the budgets that we have. And we're also always looking for grant funds for um, additional uh, to augment our city funds. And so even with this Prop 1B monies, uh, I explained to the Planning Commission and to the TCC that we are setting aside some monies for, to address some innovative techniques for pavement maintenance because we're getting that one time or in two, two allocations, Prop 1B monies. So we have that opportunity to take to, to explore those opportunities. So um, I'd like to say that help is on the way. I don't believe that we'll be able to get to all the concrete streets with the monies that we have, but at least it's a step in the right direction. And that's the seed I'd like to plant with you is that we are looking at concrete streets and historically we really haven't uh, been able to do that with the monies that we've been budgeting. Thanks, Ms. Wazik. Um, and Ms. Schneider. Thank you. I was also going to ask about concrete streets, so don't go anywhere just yet. Mm. Thanks. With the slurry seal, we have different zones with the city that we you know, we look at and we go from one to the next and rotate around. Do we have a, a prioritization list of the concrete streets from worst to best? And so if people say, I live on X street, which is a concrete street, you know, where am I on the list of how it compares to the other concrete streets in the city? Council Member Snyder, uh, for your information, we, every two years we have a consultant prepare an extensive um, report, pavement management report. And study and a third of the city is actually driven and analyzed every two years and so in a six-year cycle we get all the streets looked at and then they are assigned a pavement condition index rating and generally our concrete streets have a lower rating because they're there are many cracks in the concrete streets and the drivability etc however it's structural again a structural integrity is generally fine in concrete streets in the city so they may have a lower rating, but it is based on these ratings that we uh, program our streets to be maintained, and that in that includes concrete streets. And so, the so, um, so yeah. So I guess within the concrete street rating, is there a you know worst case, medium size, okay, just kind of bumpy, but it's structural. I mean, so I guess. Councilmember Snyder, the the ratings are reflective of, of generally the prioritization of the of how we would uh, attempt to treat them. So um, a lower rating, we would try and, and raise that up to a, a rating so that we don't have to, re you know, if the rating is, is extremely low, it would need replacement as opposed to treatment. And right. that's a very cost, cost expensive. So and we're trying to avoid that costly replacement of any road structure. That was the issue with streets. Chapala Street. I remember that we were waiting for state funding to come in. That took a while, but we finally got it. That's but correct. it was a total replacement. So the 1B pavement management program, is that part is that include concrete street management or is it just more the slurry the, seals and other kinds of management uh, we are allocating eight hundred thousand dollars of pavement monies towards uh, additional or streets in addition to the slurry seals so we're going to be looking at cape what's called cape seal uh, and it's an in-between in-between an overlay and a, and a slurry seal and we've met with the county who has uh, a list of uh, material of options that they have been trying and successfully implemented so we plan on, on implementing different strategies for for pavements and again we're going to explore uh, alternatives for concrete as well okay. and that's the good news is that we're stepping in that direction and future funding will depict how, how extensive that we can progress with this great thank you and then for mr. Allen on street sweeping we're getting an annual street sweeping um, report coming to council soon is that right yes it's scheduled to go to council on june 3rd okay when when that comes could we get a slide or table of something of all the different sources of funding that pays for it whether it's through tickets measure b the streets fund you know what what the mix is and because this is a one-time transfer um that would be helpful just to get my hands around the item and then um Obviously, we, and I mentioned this at the budget hearing about signs and what the issue is about number of signs in different parts of the neighborhood. But that can wait until the full report. We plan on covering both the funding as well as um, where we are currently with the sign, signage program and what we've done in the past. Great. Thank you. Great. Mr. Horton. Just not to flog this too much more, but could you check with some East Coast cities that have had concrete for a very, very long time, like 100 plus years, see what they do back there? 
I, there's, you know, material science is moving so fast. There's got to be something that somebody's using that works, rather than a slurry stone. Those of us who live on the Riviera hear from our neighbors, so maybe. <laughs> okay, yes, back to Mr. Casey then. Thank you very much. Some key performance objectives in the traffic operations and alternative transportation area. We're going to complete two traffic signal timing studies for greater efficiency, uh, complete speed surveys on 10 streets to assist with the enforcement uh, of speeding by the police department, locate and install 50 bicycle hitching posts, and, and I think of most interest is a, a big effort that we've promised the council and the community to move on, and that's receiving the draft project study report for the Cottage Hospital Freeway Access Improvements. That's the uh, Las Positas Interchange and uh, the Pueblo Mission Interchange and how that's all working and trying to find some solution to improve circulation as it gets there and also for access to Cottage Hospital. As part of the approval of their hospital project, they are funding this project study report so we can go further down and see if there's uh, some answers to, to help improve that area. Uh, we've released the, the request for proposals and should have someone on board and working on it pretty shortly. In the transportation drainage and system maintenance street sweeping area, uh, these are the streets crews who are out there doing a lot of the work, filling the potholes, but they also serve a lot of other functions uh, throughout the city as well. Uh, they're the folks doing a lot of the tough work in the neighborhood cleanups that we do throughout town uh, during the year. Uh, they're also the folks that we have dedicated to removing graffiti from public property within three days. Uh, and, and please call in and let us know to our graffiti hotline if, if you see graffiti. Um, we're inspecting and repainting and striping of curbs at uh, 14 schools. We're sweeping as part of the street sweeping program over 20,000 city curb miles and collecting over 1,300 tons of street debris as part of that program. And as Ms. Schneider mentioned, we'll be coming with a more detailed status report on the street sweeping program in just about a month. And we're going to be expanding to the San Roque area uh, starting in July. Some visuals of the larger projects, the uh, Haley. Uh, just for a second. Just sure. Uh, Ms. Balcone just uh, switched on her light there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Just quickly, if you could, Mr. Casey, could you go into a little detail about the graffiti removal, not the program, um, but the staffing at the moment? Because I understand that there have been some either changes or additions, or could you give me a clearer picture of how that is staffed? I'll be happy Carly. to Thank you, discuss Carly. the staffing. We currently have one full-time um, maintenance worker on the graffiti abatement crew and we have an hourly employee that assists that individual and we uh, have a maintenance coordinator Georgina Lopez who was one of the original graffiti workers who's now the maintenance coordinator and she splits her time between graffiti abatement and the street sweeping program so Georgia used to do everything including doing the noticing the private um, property owners pulling the numbers off the hotline as well as going out and painting out the graffiti now she is doing all the administrative work, and we have a maintenance worker who concentrates his efforts into removing the graffiti. It's working quite well in the, uh, the way we so put it together. So the full-time person, the full-time staff person, is still Georgia? No. Okay. In addition so to you, Georgia. In addition to Georgia. So right. Georgia is overseeing right. a full-time staff person who is then also managing or, or handling a... Um, an hourly employee who goes out and actually does the the graffiti removal. So in essence, we have two full time. If George is half time, you have a full time, and you have an hourly, which is ostensibly, let's call it half time. You have the equivalent of two FTEs in there someplace. Yeah, we have actually out there in the field. We have one full time employee actually mm -hmm. out there daily painting out graffiti. That person is assisted with an hourly employee, okay. and depending upon the time of the year, we're now approaching the summer months, mm -hmm. we see the activity in graffiti going up, so we'll ramp up and give that person more hours. So during the summer, we basically will have two full-time employees painting out graffiti. That's fine. In addition to that, then we have Georgia, separate from those two individuals, in the office doing the administrative work, and if they get behind, she has no problem putting on her overalls and going out there and assisting with painting out graffiti. Now let's take this opportunity to say thank you to Georgia, you rock. She's so, one of she's our outstanding awesome. employees. She's totally awesome. She's established okay. that. Well, I just wanted to make sure because it's, it's one of the areas of the city that uh, one of the services that we offer that is very highly used and and uh, people really notice graffiti and they want it gone as soon as possible and when I heard that Georgia had been moved or she was doing other things I really became concerned that we were losing a level of service that hadn't quite gotten to the mark anyway we need to enhance it just a little bit and it sounds like um, yeah. 
with her, getting there. Yeah, with her promotion, we've actually have been able to raise the quality of our graffiti abatement program because she can concentrate. And dealing with the private property owners, that was where our major problem was, mm -hmm. getting the private property owners to paint out the graffiti Absolutely. in the three days. We, we understand that. So yeah. it's, but, we're, uh, it's her by herself. Well. Right. Great. Well, that, that makes me feel a lot better. And for any of those people who would like to know the graffiti high, uh, hotline, uh, Ms. Snyder has it at in her, <laughs> well, you know it probably. I thought you had it at the tip of your tongue. I was going to give you a boom boom. Actually, I have it if you would like it. You might as well put it out there. It's 897-2513. You got it. 897-2513. Thank you very much. It's funny. Once you get that on your phone, you call them a lot. I can't believe how much I see around, and I, I hate to be a pest, but you know, it gets painted out so quickly. It's amazing. Anyway, Mr. Casey, you have some images up there on the screen today. And I'll, and I'll reiterate, I mean, getting that feedback from our uh, citizens throughout the community, both like on potholes and graffiti, really helps us do our job better uh, because we're not everywhere like 90,000 citizens are, and so being the eyes and ears and feeding us that information is very helpful. Just a, a slide I had here was we're committing about $125,000 a year towards graffiti abatement. And already, uh, as after three quarters, we had cleaned up over 92,000 square feet of graffiti this fiscal year. So we'll be well over 100,000 square feet of graffiti that we've cleaned up. And that's unfortunate that we're cleaning up so much graffiti on an annual basis, but we're doing a lot of work. Uh, so again, just real quick on some of the highlight of the Capital of the Streets program is funding. Uh, we've talked about it before, but it's the Haley D. Lavina Bridge. And you can just, there's a good aerial just to kind of show the complexity with the creek going right through the middle of the intersection. And so that's why that intersection would be closed down. That's why we've had to look at some of the adjoining properties to, to try to help facilitate that project. But this will help with the flooding in the area and also replace a very old bridge uh, in that intersection. Uh, the Cabrillo Bridge Replacement Project at Mission Creek, another, like I said, complicated project, but that's being funded through uh, the streets program and grant money. The Slurry Seal Program, which we've talked about before. This is just a visual of where we'll be street sweeping uh, come July, uh, with the last area being this uh, pinkish area in San Roque. And at that point, we'll have pretty much fully covered the, the flat area and curbed area of the city with our street sweeping program. The, the one areas we're not able to get to are the, the very steep and windy roads of the Riviera and, and El Cielito areas. And so we're excited about getting coverage throughout the city on street sweeping. And then one area I just want to pause and, and highlight again, because I think this has just been a tremendous success for the city and the community uh, that, that people don't realize how hard it was to achieve, and that is working with Union Pacific. Essentially, they are a private property owner with a corridor going right through the heart of the city that has huge trash, graffiti, and homeless encampments and, and other type of debris uh, that they were not doing a good job of maintaining. And they're not a local landowner. They're sometimes difficult to contact and get engaged. And we started putting pressure on them a few years ago and saying, you need to clean up your property. You have a responsibility as the property owner. And then we began a conversation of, well, will you at least grant us access to your property and pay us? We'll do it for you. Uh, if you don't have the crews to do it, let's make up this deal and we'll clean it up. If you get grant us access, uh, let us control your trains and, and reimburse us for the cost of doing so. And after a lot of persuasion by Mr. Allen and the rest of the staff, they agreed. First time that we think of in the state of California that they've agreed agreed to do this kind of partnership with the local community. And we've been cleaning it up over the last year using City, California Conservation Corps, and the Union Pacific Crews. We've worked over 6,300 hours, over 46 days on the corridor, starting from one end to the other. Uh, we have about two more days uh, to kind of hit the whole corridor for one time. We've mulched over 240 cubic yards of uh, brush and trees and removed over 488 cubic yards of trash and debris. And these are just some of the sample photos. But as you're driving along the freeway, which is the best way to see the corridor, you can really see the improvement as you go along about how much more open and clean it's been. And I want to congratulate James Russell uh, with our streets department for just an outstanding job of leading that effort. And we think it's a, a model that other communities will probably follow. It's been very successful. We've been going out on a monthly basis, uh, and we'll kind of hit the whole corridor, and then we'll go back out on a quarterly basis just to kind of keep it up on a, on a maintenance level. But it's been very successful. Ms. Falcone uh, has a question. Just briefly, I'm sorry. But I, at the last um, League of California Cities board meeting, that uh, was held in accordance with legislative action days in Sacramento a couple of weeks ago. I met a, a gentleman came from the railroad uh, who is newly on the job. 
He is representing, and I have his card in my office, and I'd like you to tell me who to pass this information along to. Uh, he is to be representing the newer, kinder, gentler Union Pacific. And uh, I talked to him for a while about this issue, and he's absolutely uh, willing. He's the, the um, vice president in charge of government relations and public relations for the Western region of, of UP and he's he's new and so he's uh, willing and so who would I who would I give that information to Mr. Allen? Yep, that'll okay. work. Okay, I've got I've got the card in my office. I just, name escapes me at the moment. Anyway, and we do appreciate Union Pacific entering into this agreement with us. It's it's a good deal. Uh, other significant projects in this uh, streets area and undergrounding, we, this is where we do the undergrounding of utilities, Cliff Drive. Uh, hopefully, we'll begin the construction on undergrounding those utilities later this fall or early winter. Uh, we have the streetlight design guidelines. This is an effort that's been going on for a number of years. We think we have consensus from the subcommittee. We're beginning now to go to the different design review boards to, to get their approval, and then we'll bring that to council and, and wrap up that effort, which, uh, while it's taken a while, I think the conclusion is good. What's Undergrounding. What's your, uh, what's your time frame for coming back around here? We, we just had the subcommittee wrap up, and so we're now going to go to ABR and HLC and the other boards and commissions and get their concurrence, assuming that goes smoothly, maybe July or August. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Uh, underground utility program. This is the, the private efforts with the roads. You've had some updates on that. You'll be getting more updates. Ferrella Road, we're uh, wrapping up and finalizing that assessment engineer's report and then bringing that one back to you. And we gave you a pretty good status report a month or two ago, and we're not sure that one will move forward. Uh, but Eucalyptus Hill Road is moving forward. That seems to have more consensus within the community at this point, uh, but we're still working on the engineer's assessment report. And then Chapala was the most recent one that you initiated, and so that'll be following behind. Behind. And then we still have seven other neighborhoods that are kind of in the initial stages of asking questions and finding out information about how to perhaps pursue that. So that program will continue to evolve and we'll see how we do. Uh, continued transit support to MTD through the streets fund and alternative transportation. And uh, State and De La Vina safety improvements will be coming to the council for direction about uh, how to move forward with that project or not. We're going to the Architectural Board of Review uh, later in this month in May. And then depending upon the action of the board there, we'll be bringing the project to council for direction. On the, uh, the transit support for MTD, is that the transit support that would be um, if Measure A passes in, in, at the end of the year here, uh, and then it goes into, would go into effect after Measure D, um, MTD would have dedicated funding for that that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be contributing that anymore. It would have already come off the top, basically, to sustain MTD on an annual basis. Is that correct? Combination of. Okay. Um, so what they consider to be their basic service, mm -hmm. so it's the enhanced transit that we did last year with lines 1 and 2, the 611, line 3, as well as the Crosstown Shuttle and the Mesa Loop. The monies that we are currently giving MTD via contract will now go, with the passage of Measure A, will go directly to uh, MTD. Uh, what MTD calls their specialized service, which is the downtown waterfront shuttle and the commuter lot shuttle, will continue to be, be operated via a contract with the city. And so, oh, you know, that's just a little over, um, just right, right around um, 1.3, 1.4 million dollars for the specialized service. I see. A good clarification. Yeah. I didn't realize that, that division. Yes. I, I should just bring up yesterday at the MTD board meeting, um, it was announced that April. So enhanced transit started in March 2007, and uh, the and April 2008 saw a 17% increase in ridership from the previous April. So, I mean, the the, incre the enhanced transit is really catching on, and they're they're seeing some really significant um, ridership increases, which is very exciting. It's, this is system wide. Oh, and and but a big part of that is as a result of the city of Santa Barbara's uh, direct participation with them on those lines. Correct. Oh, that's just great. Okay, thank you. What I'd like to wrap up in the streets fund is a conversation about. Measure D, Measure A funding, that's the half cent sales tax locally and also the utility users tax and do just two slides, uh, which I think we've shown to you before, but I think it just helps to kind of reiterate, especially with the budget discussion about what it means. So for our streets program, we have essentially two funds, a streets capital fund and a Measure D fund. Combined, they're about $14.5 million. Uh, 9.3 from streets capital, which is the utility users tax. 
uh, the state gas tax, the redevelopment agency, small contribution towards the shuttle program, and also other reimbursements. And Measure D, which is the half cent countywide sales tax, that uh, a certain portion of that flows directly to the city of Santa Barbara and helps us fund programs. Measure D will expire in 2010, and a ballot measure will be on the ballot this November, most likely. Uh, the Santa Barbara County Association governments is moving forward with that. It would be called Measure A, and it would extend the half-cent sales tax for an additional 30 years. If that doesn't pass, uh, we would lose that $5.1 million you see on the bottom half of the chart. Uh, in addition, the City Council has had conversations about potential legal threats to the utility user's tax portion that addresses communications, and that's about $2 million to the streets funds. And, uh, if that is, if a revision to the city's utility users tax ordinance is not approved and we do get legally challenged and lose, uh, we have the potential between that and Measure A not passing of losing about half of our ongoing funding for streets programs. Um, so that's a substantial chunk. And then this is just kind of a more detailed breakdown of the types of programs that we're able to fund. In the Measure D column, you can see we're supporting the road and sidewalk maintenance. That's pothole repair. Storm drain maintenance, uh, the downtown waterfront electric shuttle has $900,000 from Measure D going to that. We support easy lift operations, the enhanced transit that Mr. Allen just talked about. Uh, the Crosstown Shuttle is supported by that. Our sidewalk infill program, the Safe Routes to School, a uh, substantial portion of our pavement maintenance program, which is the slurry seals and road repair, and then traffic signals and street lights and the such. So you can see it's a pretty broad section of support uh, for important things in the community that, that we would have a very hard time of reprioritizing the remaining funds to, to try to spread around and keep. And then the $2 million that we could potentially lose from the utility users tax would come from the right side of the column. It's not broken out as specifically as Measure D, so that would be policy discussion. We'd have to come back to the City Council and talk about with our remaining uh, sources of funds, what are we going to uh, try to maintain with about half the money that we had beforehand. So just wanted to take some time to kind of underscore the, the potential budget impacts of those two measures not going forward. At this point, I'll pause and answer any other questions on the street fund that you might have before moving forward. Any other questions? Okay. Very good. Thank take you. Breath and go forth. Downtown parking. Uh, another fund. Mr. Allen oversees. Uh, it includes our parking program downtown, the maintenance of the parking lots, and also some alternative transportation programs. Uh, budget changes for the parking fund, uh, not much. Uh, we did update our revenue line items. We're combined on the hourly parking, the public benefit improvement area, and the parking benefit improvement area, and the monthly parking increasing by about $81,000, our expected revenue from that just based upon uh, usage of the parking. And reprogramming uh, a little over $400,000 to the Revenue Control Equipment Capital Program. We made an adjustment as part of the mid-year budget to keep that going and said we'd come back as part of the the two-year budget to make additional changes. We've kind of scaled back the program and taken some of the components out uh, to have the reprogramming be only about $400,000 more to kind of finish that revenue control equipment program, which uh, the, the parking committee feels is important to kind of modernize and update the revenue control equipment. Some key performance objectives, clean the lots, uh, all of them, daily by 10 a.m. and keep our parking lots looking clean. Respond to equipment malfunctions within 50 percent, uh, within 15 minutes, 90 percent of the time. Uh, this is your staff who's cleaning all the public restrooms daily, uh, including the portable restrooms, and doing a good job staying on top of that. And, of course, complete the revenue control equipment replacement, the phase two of that installation. Also, working with traffic solutions on the Curb Your Commute program. You'll be hearing a presentation from them, from them in a couple weeks uh, about just emphasizing ways to ride share and car share and get to work a different way, especially with the Highway 101 operational improvements coming up and the, and the difficulty of commuting that will occur with that. And then on the Granada Garage, just wanted to give you some statistics on the use of the Granada Garage. Uh, this first chart, I've got two of them, shows the same parking lot over different periods of time. The, the left column on each time period is lot six in 1993, what its usage was. The middle one is lot six in the year 2000 before we closed it down for construction. And then uh, the current Granada Garage, and this shows 
uh, in the light blue that the garage is exceeding the capacity of the prior lot six uh, on almost every average hour during the month of April. And so it is being well used. It's building up its usage, which makes sense for a new garage over time. And I also think we need to recognize with the Granada Theater under construction, a lot of the retail around the Granada Theater, and in addition, the San Marcos building, taking out a full block of retail for a major renovation of that building. I think as all those slowly come back online, you'll see the usage even creep up a little bit more. Question from Ms. Falcon. Mr. Casey, just a clarification, really, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a detail that is maybe without uh, uh, tremendous um, importance, but when you said the Granada Theater was under construction, if I could just clarify that, and the Granada Theater is not really under construction any longer, although there are still some things going on. It is actually the renovation of the tower and the condos and the uh, office space that is happening in the tower. So although many of us still think of that uh, from the outside as one building and one function, it's not the theater function any longer. It's really the tower, which is owned by Mr. Rossi, and it's on a completely different time schedule, and they will be going on for another two, a year and a half. Or so is that is that correct? I hate to... Oh, yes, you're, no, you're absolutely correct. I think, I think, you know, we've all been to events at the theater, we know. <laughs> well, yeah, but, <laughs> but, but, yeah, I think my point was it, just in April, it was just coming online, and I think we'll see the usage of the Granada Garage increase even more now that the theater is not under construction. We're all Correct. hopeful, but there exactly. still is a huge staging area back there. That is true. That doesn't belong to the theater anymore. It belongs to the tower. That's I true. guess I just wanted to clarify that yeah. for, the, for the public. So. And I think you'll also see the, the surrounding retail spaces around the theater are still kind of under transition and, and, and coming under their own. and hopefully we'll be filling up shortly. And then the other, I just, we just wanted to take the chance to compare it to the two other large parking structures in town. That's lot two and lot 10. Those were built uh, in, in concurrence with the building of Paseo Nuevo and their larger and more retail oriented structures. Uh, but it shows that during the daytime hours, the, the Granada parking garage, which again is the purple, the one on the right side, uh, is outperforming those two structures in many of the time periods and, and very similar to those two structures uh, until you get later kind of into the retail day and the evening hours. And we think the evening hours with the Granada Garage and the theater coming online will uh, change somewhat as it begins to get uh, more actively programmed in that regard as well. But we're showing that after, you know, two, two and a half years of operation that the structure is working somewhat on par with the other two large structures in the downtown area. Pause here for any questions on the parking fund. Uh, I have one, uh, two that are closely related. It has to do with the, um, I think there's a roof problem, at least on one of our um, garages, where there was leakage go getting down into the walls or something like that, and that was, seemed to be uh, a, a difficult problem to solve. It came up at the parking committee a couple of times. Um, and is that a, a major re need to rehabilitate the, that roof of uh, which, I don't know which lot it was, but... Uh, we have, we have a leaks in two of our facilities. One was in the offices at the Granada Garage that mm -hmm. uh, I've asked the engineering to work with the builder to make sure we have an accurate and complete uh, repair of that. And that was actually getting in the walls, and we actually had flooding in the, uh, the kitchen on the second floor in the office area. Mm -hmm. you know, that was one concern. The other area is the roof deck of Lot 9, the one by the Libero Theater, mm -hmm. where we had some water intrusion, too. And we have money budgeted. If, yeah, in the, in the capital improvement program that we'll be addressing that in future years to mm -hmm. address that problem as well. I thought we had one where the, uh, the, prev the previous ceiling of the roof hadn't been done really, really well. Well, yeah, and you're correct, and that's what was discussed at the parking committee, you know, that the contractor who did the, the work um, when Lot 9 was seismically retrofitted, did they do that correctly? Um, we're not sure, mm -hmm. but it's been done so long ago. But it's on us to fix it It's on us now. to fix it because the statute of limitations has, has okay. run for us to go after the previous contractor or designer. And the second thing is the about $500,000 a year that's going into a sinking fund uh, from the parking f fund. Does that, that doesn't, does that go into reserves or is that still held as, as like a, a, in a, in a capital fund as a, as a negative, if you will, just being held there. How does that work? Yeah. The goal when we did the rate adjustment a couple of years ago was to try and generate an additional $500,000 a year to be put in a capital reserve fund to be used for capital projects. I see. Okay. We have not met that for the first two years for a variety of reasons. And Mr. Casey mentioned one of them with the theater being under construction and a lot of the vacant retail. 
as well as some reduction in parking just because we did a rate adjustment. We're seeing the revenue start to come back up again. Hopefully in a few years we'll, we'll start seeing that a half a million dollars. Okay, we haven't begun to even to set that aside. It's just no. a, an idea. Yeah, it's point. an idea. We, we are meeting the revenue target in terms of having enough money that we needed to generate for the operations of the parking right. program, but we're, and we're, we're generating about half the two hundred, uh, the $500,000 we were trying to generate to go into capital reserve fund that the parking committee requested. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Anything else? All right, go on. Interest city service funds. Uh, that's what we call the ICS funds. These are essentially funds where we're providing services to other departments and funds in the city and charging them for the cost of those services. So it's facilities, the maintenance of our public buildings. It's uh, custodial services to those facilities. It's also our motor pool operations, and it's our energy conservation efforts. Uh, here's just a breakdown by the different programs of the ICS funds to show you the building maintenance is the larger uh, chunk of it as well as the motor pool and motor pool replacement fund and then custodial services and communications make a smaller portion of that. Budget changes because uh, a lot of these funds are supported by the general fund departments. We looked at ways to, to try to assist with the budget reductions that we needed to make. And so we were able to freeze the general fund rates at the fiscal year 08 level uh, for general fund departments for these services. And that was able to save the general fund about $208,000. And so we think we can do that while still maintaining the services that we can provide to the departments for, for one-time savings there. Another budget change, which really doesn't have a, a fiscal impact, is just increasing the replacement purchases by $150,000. We have a very good replacement program in the motor pool where we're setting aside funds every year to replace uh, vehicles on a five to seven year cycle. Uh, this just fluctuated a little bit in one year based upon the request of departments for the purchases of their vehicles, but it's funded out of that replacement program. And so it's, a, it's an adjustment to the fund, but it really doesn't have a financial impact on the general fund or the departments. Some of the performance objectives, uh, completing a city greenhouse gas emissions inventory uh, will be done. Uh, we're going to convert a public restroom to reclaimed water use, uh, which will be good. We're going to begin evaluating uh, doing a B50 biodiesel blend uh, for our diesel trucks. We're currently using B20. And so we're going to uh, just take a few and do a test case and see if we went to a B50 blend, would the vehicle still perform and be able to be maintained kind of in a similar man manner. So we'll, we'll push the envelope on a pilot uh, case there. Meeting the new regulations for diesel vehicle retrofits, and that just requires some additional work on the vehicles that we will perform. And maintaining the communication center, the 911 center, uh, at 100 percent readiness. Uh, some visuals, I think you heard this on Friday in your presentation from the library, but the facilities crews are the folks who are going to be doing the work as well. But that's the ADA restroom upgrades at the library, uh, going to be starting shortly, and so that's exciting to get that project done. And even more exciting, I think, is the, the children's area, uh, moving it downstairs and working with uh, the Junior League, helping to fund that, just a great public-private partnership there uh, to make some wonderful improvements at the library. The solar yard project, we finished uh, finalizing the agreement just in the last day or so with the uh, provider of the 300 kilowatt solar system, solar fo photovoltaic system uh, over our corporate, corporate yards. So the ball's in their court to move now and get that project completed. They need to uh, finish their structural design for the support of the system, go through plan check, and then begin construction hopefully this summer. Uh, and get that up and running. And they're under a timeline to receive some of their uh, financial grants, and so they have some pressure on them to, to get moving. And so we're excited to see that moving forward. We are going to uh, try to certify under LEADS for existing building. LEADS stands for the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's, uh, it's kind of the national standard for green building techniques. And you have a program for existing buildings where you go in and look at how you're maintaining your building, how do the heating and ventilation and air conditioning systems work most efficiently and other items. So we're going to try to certify the 630 Garden Street building uh, under that program. And if we're successful, uh, move forward and look at City Hall and other city facilities as well. And the, the benefit of, of starting with 630 Garden Street is that uh, it, it's a point-based system, the LEADS program. And we'll, by doing 630 Garden, establish a lot of baseline points from just good citywide practices that then would apply to every facility that we might go and look at getting an existing building certification for. Uh, and so we're going to be working on that. 
Then on the motor vehicle side, uh, just kind of showing our commitment and effort at looking at alternative fuels for our vehicle fleet, uh, we have about close to 500 vehicles in our fleet, and that includes sedans, uh, light and heavy-duty trucks, but also fire engines and police cruisers and, and the whole gamut. This chart, uh, what you want to take away is on the upper right-hand corner in the green shade, those are all of the equipment that we're running on biodiesel. And uh, so we've had good success in getting a good portion of the fleet running on the biodiesel. Up over here, uh, a smaller portion are the sedans that we have with hybrid and electric vehicles, which is good. The polka dotted areas where we think we have good opportunity to continue to, to pursue hybrids and electric vehicles. And where we're having a challenge is down in the light duty truck area, which we have quite a bit with the parks crews and, and the water and wastewater crews, where they're just, uh, the technology isn't there yet at this size of vehicle for looking at alternative fuels. And so we think it's coming, and then when it's coming, we'll evaluate it from a cost effective standpoint and pursue it as need be. Uh, uh, but Mr. Right, Mr. Horton has a question here for you. I'll just interrupt. Just, just interested in knowing it doesn't have to be now uh, if you have any uh, cost of uh, fuel comparisons. Could you uh, shoot something out? I'd be interested in knowing what, what we're paying for BioD. Are we using ethanol, by the way? No. Gary. Gary Horwald, our fleet superintendent, can answer that question for you. Mr. Horton, Gary Horwald. Um, and uh, no, we're not using ethanol at this time. It's not available um, for purchase um, in our area, but it's something we are purchasing vehicles that are capable of running on ethanol um, with an eye on the future. And then do you have cost information on what we're paying for uh, B20, you know, compared to regular diesel? And Yeah, I, I can, off the top of my head, I can tell you it's about, uh, it varies quite a bit. Right now we're probably paying about 15 cents more per gallon for biodiesel than we are for regular diesel, but the cost of regular diesel has gone up quite a bit as well, so. And then two other just real brief slides kind of showing our 2008 vehicle orders. 77% uh, of the vehicles we ordered in 2008 are alternative fuel. And breaking it down a little bit more, you can see that uh, biodiesel is a good chunk. There's uh, the ethanol-capable vehicles uh, in case that becomes a viable option for us, as well as the hybrids and the electrics. And again, the gas is predominantly those size of vehicles that don't really provide us an option or, or the police cruisers where they need uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of the vehicle that we got to be sensitive to. Some significant projects and updates uh, in the ICS funds with regards to facilities. Working on a facilities renewal plan, that's something Mr. Dewey is really kind of taking on and looking at all of our facilities and coming up with a managed multi-year program of, of uh, what it would take to maintain our facilities at an appropriate level, and then we'll have to try to move towards funding that. Uh, on the energy efficiency, a lot going on. It's a very exciting time. The South Coast Energy Efficiency Partnership is renewing, and we're hoping that that will lead toward more funds for us to be able to retrofit uh, city facilities. There's a new affinity program that Edison is rolling out, and they're ask, actually going to partner with the city to use us as a, as a pilot uh, group to work with on the affinity program, which is exciting, and that means a pilot pro project with us that'll begin in the next month or two. It'll give us additional financial resources to retrofit existing city facilities. Uh, continue the diesel retrofit program. And then finally, uh, looking at the potential, the, the Council Sustainability Subcommittee uh, is looking at the, uh, rec well, actually, they've already made the recommendation for the city to pursue carbon neutrality by the year 2020. And that will be coming to the city council in the next month or two. I believe it's in June. Uh, and so that is a ambitious goal. I, I think the council subcommittee will acknowledge it was an ambitious goal. And they said, you know, staff, you're great. We're going to set the bar really high and see how high you can jump. And um, that, that's what we do. And, but that will be coming to the city council. And w from the budget standpoint, I just want to lay out the concept that if the city council is going to adopt a carbon neutral goal by 2020, that's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of time. And it's going to take a commitment of staff resources such that I just want to lay the concept out there so it's not a shock to you that I, I think if you want us to be serious about it, we're going to need to look at additional staff resources to help support that effort uh, to really take it seriously and, and look at an energy position under Mr. Dewey and the facility program uh, to take that on aggressively. We, initial thoughts and concepts about how you would fund it is perhaps look at the proportional use of energy among all your different funds and enterprise funds in the city and have each of them uh, 
chip in their proportionate share, which would make the general fund contribution to such a position about 15 percent, as uh, the vast majority of the energy usage, not the vast majority, but the majority of energy usage comes from utilities of water and wastewater. And then the other funds kind of use energy at similar levels there. So I just wanted to float that idea out to you as you consider that uh, program going forward. Happy to answer any questions with regards to ICS funds. Ms. Falcone. When you do, um, it, it seems to me along the lines that you were just saying about staff resources and staff time, that there are an awful lot of programs that are being uh, forwarded for investigation or for uh, um, further, further discussion and, and there are some projects that we've already said go forward with, like the solar uh, array on the, on the yard. I'm wondering whether or not there is somewhere a comprehensive list of these various different projects that go toward the energy efficiency in that we could, in a global sense, sort of evaluate. I mean, all these programs are coming to us and we seem to be saying yes to all of them. It's getting, it's getting a little unwieldy, I think, in, in people's minds, and, and it might help certainly me to get it a little more organized so we actually do know exactly what it is we're doing because we can't be all things to all people, and it sounds like we may be trying to, to do that. And so I'm a little concerned, and you're just saying that your departments are getting a little spread thin, and it does pervade a whole lot of other departments and, and, and workloads, and especially if you're going to want um, departments to chip in where they're actually being asked to cut this year and possibly next. Uh, you know, it's important to be ambitious and look forward and see how we can stay on the cutting edge and do that, but I just don't want to get us so far out in front that we start falling on our own feet kind of thing and, and not doing things well. So I'd like to see at some point a comprehensive list of the things that have come down the pike in the last two or three years. A, a suggestion could be when um, we bring our sustainability annual report, which would be in August, September, and it would have the list of what, what we've done to date this past year and then what the goals are, and that can include the whole laundry list of various projects that, that we're hearing in Sustainability Committee and bringing up piecemeal, but then this way you can see the whole menu. That, I think that would be very good, especially if it were to contain, um, I don't know if what happened last night, I was in here, I was in Seattle, uh, with the CAC or the CCA or the, the Community mm -hmm. Aggregation uh, piece, whether or not that fits into the sustainability program or not. But there are an awful lot of, of these things. So even if it's not specifically within the program, maybe a collateral list of related uh, activities could also be brought at that time. And that sounds like a, a very good moment. Thank you. And, and I might add organizationally, one of the reasons that we changed the title of uh, Mr. Dewey's or Mr. Dewey's title to facilities and energy manager is that we felt that we needed one place in the organization to start dealing with, have a centralized point for all energy issues and kind of build the expertise up. And I think, I think Mr. Dewey has started on that. Um, but I think, as Paul said, if we're really serious about wanting to reduce our energy usage, it's probably going to require additional staff resources. Um, because Mr. Dewey is still doing all the jobs that, uh, that Mr. Grimes did previously, as well as adding this to his portfolio. And um, we're not sure what those resources are. A lot of it will depend on the 2020 discussion. But I think um, there's, we've been kind of cobbling that together at this point. And um, to really go to the next step, we're going to have to add those kind of resources, especially the analytical skills. And there's contract management skills. Um, and I could go on and on. And, and we use energy all over the organization in a variety of different ways. And, um, and we're going to probably have to ramp it up. And, and I would just follow up on that in Ms. Falcone's comments as well. You know, a lot of our energy efficiency efforts on our facilities and our pumps and our motors and the water and wastewater system, it, that's stuff we should be doing anyway. So we should be looking at energy efficiency and how to save resources and money. And, and that's not what I'm saying we really need a lot of additional staff resources because I think that's what we should be doing. It's when you're setting uh, high goals that, as Mr. Armstrong says, require a lot of analytical work and studies and analysis and looking at getting into the energy business and, and looking at alternative sources of energy and, and that sort of stuff. That, that's more complicated work that we could use additional 
assistance on if that's where we go. Um, I have a question that I, I don't know if, that it's related, but when we talk about staffing, one of the things that you're doing, the biggest thing almost that you're doing um, this year, at least what we have here recommended for implementation, is holding one full-time equivalent position, um, project engineer vacant. And do you want to describe that to us and tell us what you're how that works out? Yeah, Mayor Pro Tem House, that was back in the general fund in the, the engineering oh, okay. division of the section, and so that's a project engineer that is uh, one of a number of project engineers we have that's supporting the capital program, and we had a vacancy there and thought by holding that open that would uh, be a benefit to the general fund, and that's one of the sacrifices we're making along with other departments to try to meet our budget reduction goal. It doesn't really impact the ICS or the energy efforts. I see. Okay. No, I heard engineer there. Okay. Um, Mr. Davis, uh, why don't you come on up here? I, uh, we have one one speaker who wanted to speak in a, on the operating capital budget. Um, I, this would be related to this, sir? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Dave Davis from the Community Environmental Council. Yeah, directly on this portion of the public works budget, we came today, as you would expect, to basically be supportive of looking at moving forward with the energy programs that you've already set out to do. Um, we support the idea basically of, of helping Jim Dewey in his implementation of your current programs. And there's a lot to do. Regardless of all these new things, we believe that you need at least another person, the technician, to help him do the technical stuff just to do the existing programs. I think that's really, really clear to us in that regard. Those programs, though, in terms of energy efficiency, and I think Mr. Casey really outlined it, those are things which as a business, you should be doing anyway, because in fact, you have energy efficiency, you save money in long term, those costs basically are recovered very, very rapidly. And it's the cheapest energy that we can produce through conservation and energy efficiency. <clears throat> Ms. Falcone's comment, you don't have to, to reiterate to me running a little nonprofit, this stuff, it's coming out of everybody's ears of all these things that we should be doing. What we've done is we've developed a strategic plan. Clearly, we have this idea of where we need to go. How do we get there? So we have short-term goals, and they're mainly the energy efficiency and transitional fuels, things that you're doing. That's a three-year program in that regard. We have medium-term from four years to 10 years of things that we need to set in place in order to look at really pretty much transformative change on business as usual by 10 years to 20 years. So we're really looking at it as it's, the, the energy question as we see it isn't an immediate thing. It is something which there are immediate things we can be working on and you are doing them. And then there are goals that we can see in the future. This carbon neutral goal is one. And there will be transformative things, the, the, the application of a lot of, of renewables sometime in that 10 to 20 year period which could get us there as a community. So again, I've, my suggestions to your staff has been, look at it like a capital improvement program, that you have some long-term capital needs out there in the 10 to 20 years. What do you need to do to be ready to set that up in the four to 10 year period? So the CCAs and what have you, they're tools, but only options tools. We talked about you know, the old question of a, of a silver bullet for this question? Well, you probably heard people are now talking silver buckshot. It's really, there's all sorts of things which are gonna be there. And what we need to do is to prioritize them, identify which ones get the biggest bang for the buck, and then to put your money basically where your return is the highest. We think right now the highest return you're gonna get is to take in Jim Dewey's position and backing that up with technical capability to get you energy savings in your facilities and pushing that out to the community. Mm -hmm. So we really support that idea. Why don't you stay there for just a second. Ms. Schneider has a question, but I just, <coughs> one I just want to put out. What do you see uh, the Community Environmental Council's role in all of this uh, it might be? You're, we're talking about the city of Santa Barbara here today, but you're coming up as a private organization, a nonprofit, How, but well, very again, technically. You know, we always basically, standard answer would be, we're here to help you in any way, shape, or form that you think would be helpful to you. We think the biggest thing that we could help with is sometime when you need help with outreach, we have outreach. We can do that efficiently and at a lower cost than anybody else can do. So we can help you with outreach when you go out there. And some of the, if you push it out into the private sector, making those contacts for energy retrofits and what have you, 
we're doing that. We're working with the business community, the faith community, the nonprofit community to do that. So we have, again, at least the infrastructure to do that. So we can work with your staff whichever way basically meets your goals the best. Well, thank you. Ms. Schneider? Well, it's just not necessarily a question, but to piggyback on what's been said, not just by Mr. Davis, but all around, of also looking at potential funding sources um, that either can come through the city or to an organization like CEC. Uh, last week at the Sustainability Subcommittee, Karen Quimby from Lois Capps' office was there to give us an update of the um, energy block grants. And, and uh, of course, it's not appropriated yet, but it was signed into law where cities are going to get block grant money specifically <coughs> for energy savings related projects. And the, the rules and guidelines are still being um, put together in Washington, D.C., but we're looking at, you know, $100,000 or more per year. Um, in, in that kind of funding for specific projects. And then I believe in working with CEC, it would be good to look at other grant sources for things like technical expertise and funding in order to um, enable us to get the programs that we want going. Um, and, you know, there are other things such as the CT project at Tahiguas. I mean, that's, you know, there's so many things. You're right that there's so many things that we're looking at in the city. Some of them, like CCA, we said yesterday, we're not going to be, the only player even looking at this in order to make it work we need a more of a regional cooperation and we don't know if we even have that yet so that was por the part of yesterday is to determine whether that's you know feasible or not so um, but I think that's that's a key point in terms of when we look at future resources and the budget it's not necessarily just taking out of our current budget but looking at opportunities for grant funding or other things that because it's something new and innovative there are sources out there that that could fund those kind of things and that would again then save us money over time because then we're reducing our energy cost so. uh, Ms. Falcone just briefly Mr. Davis thank you very much for uh, coming and, and for giving us your support and CEC is of course one of the bedrock environmental organizations in this community, this region and possibly the state. Um, we're very grateful that you're here. We're very grateful that uh, you're such a tremendous resource and all of the ideas that you have brought to us and plans and encouragement for us to uh, begin down these roads. As you say, you have a strategic plan. Um, people must remember that you also ran this very large organization, ran, but you were an integral part of this very large organization for a number of decades. And so you understand both sides of the coin. All of the various programs that you've brought to us that we have jumped on enthusiastically so far, uh, and I, I have my reservations about CCA and, and uh, for the reasons that Ms. Uh, Schneider just said, but we have a s tremendously strong partnership with Edison as well, and it's going to come down to whether or not we think they can do the job and meet the goals of renewable resources, or is this other vehicle? So those are choices that we'll have to make down the road, and I know that you will be there to help in, in a very, um, in part of the analytical way and in part of the non-biased, uh, non-judgmental way that what is really best for this region and what is really the best uh, way that we can go. I'm glad that we're going to partner with Edison on the, uh, on the new program and we're going to be their, their guinea pig, their, uh, their sort of uh, first project under this or one of, one of the ones in the state, I know. And um, so I, I think that we also need a chance to get our strategic plan under our belt. You, you have yours, so you kind of know the steps that you think are the way to achieve the goal. Um, we, as you well know, move in a much more lumbering sort of oh, way. Oh, you guys are doing great. What are you talking about? <laughs> Give yourself <laughs> more credit. We're doing you great, guys, you guys are you doing fantastic. You understand my concern about continuing to take on more and more and more in terms of uh, these sort of gigantic programs and, and paradigm shifts, which I'm not saying we shouldn't do. I'm just caution in motion is, I guess, my, no, my and mantra. And, and, uh, and, and yesterday I didn't speak. If I had spoken yesterday, what I would have said is, don't take our position on CCA such that we think this is something which, one, should happen, mm -hmm. uh, or two, that this is something which we feel that the city has to undertake. 
Because it's not. I mean, my, my board sees it as we need to see what are the options for this region to get renewables. Sure. This is fine. only one. Yeah. Okay. And it right now it has some serious structural and political risk associated with it. Mm -hmm. So we in no way, shape, or form are saying, you, we're not going to push you. You have to do CCA. Mm -hmm. But we truly believe the region should at least investigate the, the basis of CCA over the next couple. This is a longer-term project, next two to three years. We're going to see what happens with initiatives which are coming along, which will deal with the same issue. We're going to see what happens with the California Energy Commission and what they do with Edison and the investor-owned utilities. And we're going to see what they do themselves heading into that 2010 RPS deadline that they're, they're rapidly rushing to get right. to. <clears throat> Our bringing CCA to you really was saying that is a mechanism that this region can work together to achieve some goals, and at least we need to position the region for that period of time through this feasibility study. I thought Jim did an incredible analysis showing you a lot of things, but he had one slide, and that slide says, what will we get out of this feasibility study? And it was more than yes or no on CCA. It had a lot to do with the development of renewables within the region, your own infrastructure needs and financing capabilities. There was a lot more there that's transferable to the larger question. That's what we see the value of the feasibility study. And if in fact all the other things don't pan out, RPS standards, clean air and solar, no, solar and clean energy act, all these other things go south then, in fact, we'll have information about is there a path for this region. So okay. we'll put all this in the context of the budget since we didn't right. have the uh, CCA right. agenda I, I, I for today. To, <laughs> I didn't mean to. No, get, but it, get it, the actually, it's part because can let me say that you know we have brought to you two pretty significant things: a carbon neutral plan, which is a 20-year capital program to move forward, at least a vision for a 20-year capital program. I personally don't think in the next couple of years. What you're doing essentially is the first stage, that's three-year plan. You're already doing it. So I think it's more what's it going to take to get farther out there. And what's it going to take way out there has to do with bringing on more renewables, which has these longer-term issues. Mm -hmm. On the budget today, we're here to support some additional staffing for Mr. Dewey to do your current energy efficiency programs. I had lunch with him a few weeks ago, and he has an idea on this affinity program of moving it out into the private sector. Fantastic. Really thinking, you know, out of the box, but really goal-oriented towards bringing down energy usage within the city. <clears throat> but he can't do the other 80% of his job and the 80% that's going to okay. take it here. So we'll, we're we'll, ask, we'll ask staff for maybe some response to the idea of additional staffing. And, uh, yeah, yeah, well, we're very supportive. And, and again, I'm glad I actually got a chance to clarify the CCA thing because, in fact, it, it's not as solid ground and you must do it. And no, it's not. In fact, do it for the right reasons only. Well, Mr. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem, I appreciate that. And I, and I did not mean to focus on I wasn't here for the discussion. As I said, I was, I was in the Great Northwest. Um, but, but it's the it's the aggregate of all of the stuff because we've got a lot of things going on in the environmental services area we've got a lot of things going on uh, in the community development and as far as the green building standards we've got another program that you asked us to do that we're doing in that regard and and so there's there's a, a great sort of large picture here that I just don't want us to get too far ahead of ourselves, and I know that it's very exciting. We're all very excited about doing it, but if we don't do each thing as well as we can, so I appreciate I appreciate that. And you know, getting more staff, it doesn't just come from the air; it comes from someplace else, and we need to to prioritize that. And I know you understand that. So, in the context of the budget, the larger picture is that we need to you know, figure out where we get that extra be person as be well. Be strategic, which is what you're saying right. in terms of where you That's put right. your energies, but in pun intended. <laughs> but in this particular case, putting some of the energy into this particular program will lead to energy efficiencies, which will lead to cost savings, which will lead to a cleaner environment. It's a win-win-win. Great summer. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Francisco, and then we're going to go on with the uh, presentation on ICS fund. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I'll try to keep this brief. Um, Take your time. Every, <laughs> every company I've ever worked for 
has implemented energy efficiency because it saves money. It makes sense. We don't need initiatives, I think, from city council to achieve that. Um, public works, I assume, is being run as a business. And because energy efficiency is a good thing in itself, it saves money, um, it will be implemented. Whereas the more speculative, maybe highly speculative, things like trying to achieve carbon neutrality here in Santa Barbara, uh, those things are way outside the focus. And I agree with Council Member Falcone that since those are essentially um, philosophical rather than business decisions, that we do need to keep a close look on uh, how many of those were floating at once. Thanks. Thank you very much. We're going to be back to you, Mr. Casey, after a little detour. <laughs> but it wasn't so detoured. It was actually right about the stuff that you were talking about. Well, and that, that's and, why and I brought the issue and there's up, this, though. Is just a, a key question <laughs> did, get a, uh, did rise there. Perhaps, uh, if not today, at some point we should hear back a little bit this encouragement of having uh, additional position technical staff to support Mr. Dewey in some of these efforts. It would be good for us to get a response at some point. Today. And that's why you know we're not prepared as part of this budget submittal to, to ask for more staff. And that, mm -hmm. But I just wanted to lay the issue out that as you look at the carbon neutral plan uh, upcoming, that if you really want to go forward and go aggressive, we may want to go out of cycle and look at some additional staff resources prior to a year from now uh, with the next budget cycle. And that's a policy decision we'll have with you and take your direction. Okay. Water fund. Time. On to the W's, the water fund. Uh, the water fund, we have two, you know, oftentimes we talk about the water fund and it's water and wastewater. We're going to talk about water uh, first, and Kathy Taylor is going to join me for that one. And then John Schof will be here for wastewater. But the water fund is water supply, water treatment, water distribution, and recycled water. Uh, from a budget standpoint, pretty much status quo. We had a planned 3.5% rate increase adopted in the two-year budget, and so we're proposing to go forward with that, and that's just to maintain uh, ongoing costs. In addition, there was one minor adjustment that the Water Commission is recommending to the Council that, that staff is supporting, and that was to make a slight modification with regards to the agricultural rates. We had some of the growers come to the Water Commission and talk about the benefit of agricultural in our community and the high cost of water plays into the economics of agriculture. So the Water Commission agreed not to do the 3.5% rate increase for the Block 1 rates, which is the first allotment of water uh, that the agricultural users use, and then also to increase that Block 1 rate by 25% to give them that, that cheapest amount of water, a little bit more breathing room for their agricultural uh, efforts. And so the Water Commission, on that, it, it doesn't really have a material impact on the overall water budget, and, and so it's a little something to kind of uh, take the edge off for the agricultural growers, and so the Water Commission recommended that and that's being proposed as part of this budget now as well. Also, we've added a $1.5 million capital project, and that's the opportunity to purchase the office space across the street from 630 Garden Street in the Mental Health Association building. If you recall, when that project got approved, it included about 3,000 square feet of community priority square footage uh, with the idea that the city might want to purchase it to kind of create a campus because of our tough uh, uh, space needs, especially at 630 Garden, uh, a good opportunity that they build it, we buy it for, from them and go forward. It makes a lot of sense for the water fund to purchase it as uh, they were looking at some additional space uh, in that general vicinity to begin with. Uh, so good opportunity. The Water Commission is supportive of that. We'll be able to move the water supply staff over across the street, which will make sense, and perhaps some additional staff from Community Development Department, which would then pay rent to the water fund kind of on a proportional scale as they pay rent now to the city uh, in their facilities charges. So we'll get about 12 to 14 staff uh, in that across the street if we move forward with that. And then also we're going to be recommending uh, increasing for water treatment due to the Zaka fire impacts about one and a half million dollars next fiscal year for water treatment. It's going to be costly and I'll talk a little bit about that more uh, at the end of this fund discussion. Key performance objectives, of course, keep compliance with the drinking water regulations, upgrade and replace the pumps to save energy, again, making those business decisions to, to get efficiency out of the system to save energy, uh, restore water service within eight hours of a line break, and assist city departments with the implementation and recommendations of sustainability audits, and that's just our ongoing water conservation efforts that we've got good staff who are always uh, promoting and pushing in that regard. Significant projects in the waterfront. A lot of interesting stuff going on in waterfront in the next few years. Uh, one is beginning the design of the ozone treatment for the Cater Water Treatment Facility. 
We were at Council back in September talking about that, how to meet the new regulations that are coming down, I believe, by 2011, and looking at an ozone-type process to uh, increase the treatment of our water to meet those regulations. Uh, you gave us the go-ahead to do some preliminary work. We've done that. We've also met with our partners because we do partner with the Montecito Water and Carpinteria Water Districts uh, on the operations of Cater. They're on board with this approach as well. And so during the next fiscal year, we'll begin the, the full-scale design of that treatment at Water Cater. Hydroelectric uh, power plant reactivation analysis, you approved that contract a couple weeks ago, so that will be going forward this fiscal year. The Ortega well upgrades to be able to treat our, our uh, uh, underground water uh, source and some good kind of creative solutions to how to treat that water have kind of evolved over the last few months and so we'll continue pursuing that uh, design approach which will uh, if it proves fruitful will be a much lower scale design treatment than what we were having to look at before uh, which was a much major more major system so that's kind of an exciting uh, change in that scope hopefully Replacing the solids removal equipment at Cater, just keeping the, that facility and plant uh, up to speed. And then as part of Plant Santa Barbara, updating our long-term water supply plan. That will be a big effort of Bill Ferguson and his group to look at our water supply, look at the growth scenarios that Plant Santa Barbara is looking at and try to match and marry the, the growth scenarios with our water supply. And including in that, We'll begin analysis of what it would take to reactivate the desalinization facility. We've had a number of questions, both from water commissioners and members of the public, about do we really know how much and how soon we could reactivate the desal plant? And it was kind of really gaining momentum in December when we weren't sure it was going to rain again. And uh, January it rained, which is great, but we still need to be looking at that question. And just uh, to reiterate, our current water supply, long-term water supply, does include desalinization water as part of our water supply system. When you look at, we do those annual water reports and look at kind of a five-year worst-case drought scenario, it shows, you know, desal kicking in there in years four and five. Uh, and so that's where we think doing this analysis to, to get a feel for how real and how easy and or how costly it would be to reactivate that uh, facility is important to do. And then Zaka Fire uh, has a lot of projects and water quality issues, which is uh, turning out to be one of the more challenging water treatment uh, eras that uh, staff have been here for 20 or 30 years have Before ever seen. Before you go into the Zaka thing, yeah. back up just one real quick. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Mr. Horton had a question. If we just wondering about um, Sheffield. That's been online now for several months, if not years. Yeah. Wondering how that's performing, and does the uh, Zaka, Zaka fire? I assume that a lot of the sediments come down in there and are filtered out up above it. So, do we have any idea of the performance of that Sheffield reservoir, and is it is it meeting its specifications? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab, and then Ms. Taylor can fill in. The Sheffield Reservoir actually is water after it goes through the Cater Water Treatment Plant, and so it's below the system of the Cater Water Treatment Plant. So the Cater Treatment Plant is the one that's taking on the burden of treating the water impacts from the Zaka fire. Uh, the Sheffield Reservoir really is just working as a reservoir post-treatment and then distribution through the system that way. Anything to add, Ms. Taylor? No. As you said, it is a, a reservoir post-treatment, so really it's the Cater Water Treatment Plan that is seeing the, uh, the brunt of the treatment issues at this point. But uh, in resp response to your question of how the Sheffield uh, project is performing, it's performing very well and up to expectations. And if uh, you've been up there recently, the landscape is coming in quite light nicely and it's uh, blending with, in with the surrounding areas, so it's, it's beautiful. One of the reasons I asked was there's four trucks up there this morning on top. I was wondering what was going on. Okay. Zaka Fire, just want to give you a brief update. As you know, uh, we sent out a notification to the public a couple weeks ago, uh, briefing the public about the impacts of Zaka Fire as well, because we think communication on an ongoing basis is going to be very important. But the Zaka Fire has had real serious implications to our water supply. The Independent recently, Ray Ford just had a column in there, which is a good column, kind of summarizing the, the difficulties we're facing. Basically, we had the fire last summer. Uh, we knew that we would have impacts, but we didn't know when, depending upon when and how much it would rain. And then January was an extremely heavy rainfall, and so we're 
seeing the impacts now. We're seeing it from the ash, silt, and debris uh, from the burn area flowing into Gibraltar at quite high levels. It's increasing the levels of organic carbon, which then reacts with chlorine and creates uh, water quality issues that we need to treat. It creates higher levels of nutrients, which result in algae blooms, which are difficult from a water supply standpoint. Uh, it clogs the system up, but also creates musty taste and smell. And so where it may not be a water quality issue that where we exceed any federal standards, uh, you feel it as a consumer uh, with changes to the taste and smell of the water, which we may see this summer. Uh, and then, of course, also the loss of reservoir capacity, which we knew was going to happen. Um, so on the first part, on the, on the drinking water quality standards, our water is safe. We're able to treat this water, and we're doing it, we're doing it at, water, at the Cater Treatment Plant. Uh, it's costing a lot of money with this carbon activation process that we're doing. Uh, it's costing a lot of money because we're having to flush the system much more frequently than we were before. We're having to run the plant 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which we weren't having to do before. Uh, to try to keep up with the treatment, but it's working well. We're under uh, the required standards, and we're hoping that through the summer we'll still be able to keep the water uh, under those regulatory standards. And so real credit goes to Susan Thomas and the rest of the water treatment staff for just doing yeoman's work uh, in that regard. It is costing more money. You've already approved a couple emergency purchase orders, and that's why we're rec recommending another $1.5 million next fiscal year for this additional treatment. We've submitted requests to the state to get reimbursed for those costs. We're waiting any day to hear if they're going to accept uh, the treatment cost as a reimbursable emergency expense. Uh, we hope so. If not, this is why we have water reserves. We have good, adequate water reserves. And so from a budget standpoint, you know, we can absorb those costs. It's not great, and we think it is an impact of the fire and should be eligible for reimbursement, but we'll see. We've got a couple of experts on board who are assisting us in monitoring Gibraltar and the water quality and how our treatment is going at the Cater Treatment Plant. We're working with the Kachuma Operations Board. We're going to begin, I think, bi-weekly testing of both Kachuma and Gibraltar to really stay on top this summer because as it heats up and as the water heats up, that's when you have more of the water quality issues and, and the algae blooms that are more complicated. Our experts feel that there will be an echo effect over the years such that this will probably be the toughest summer and then each year it will become less of an issue and so we think that you know the worst is right in front of us and then we'll be able to handle it better in, in future years hopefully going forward. Uh, and then the loss of reservoir capacity, Gibraltar has been silting up, and we knew it would be silting up uh, for a number of years. In fact, we have what's called a pass-through agreement that as we lose capacity in Gibraltar, we kind of get to keep that down in Kachuma because we knew that was going to happen. Unfortunately, the, the debris flow from the fire is just accelerating uh, that silting up of the reservoir to a very great extent. We will know more when we do another bathymetric survey at the end of summer. Uh, we did one. Uh, this fall, last fall, prior to the rains, because we wanted to get a good before, and now we're going to get a good after reading of uh, how much siltation we got into the reservoir. And again, we're protected from our water rights as the city of Santa Barbara with this pass-through agreement, but I think over the next few years, you're going to see the South Coast as a whole become much more concerned about it because we're losing our capacity as a South Coast on the other side of the mountains as Gibraltar silts up. We all then start relying more on Kachuma. And so I think in a mini multi-year effort, we're going to have to look at somehow getting some additional capacity back into Gibraltar. It's going to be very difficult and very hard. Uh, the city owns Gibraltar, but it's surrounded by the federal forest, and so regulatory-wise, it's very difficult to uh, find an appropriate approach to how to uh, increase capacity there. It's in a very remote area, and so it's hard to get to. Just a lot of complicating factors, but I think from the South Coast perspective long term, we're going to want to look at uh, getting that capacity back up in one way or another. Any questions on the water fund? Uh, we have one for you here, Ms. Falcone. It's, it's, it has to do with the pass-through agreement, not the agreement, but the physical capacity for Kachuma to hold pass-through water. We, uh, several years ago, got the okay to increase the level by three feet across the board. Is the, is the capacity that you're talking about in excess of that three feet, and if so, what hoops are we going to have to jump through, or is it within? Can we? Can we? I, up to a certain point, we can pass through the water and we can keep it 
within the three feet. But the three feet was done for a different reason, wasn't it? Can you? Can I think the three feet was for steelhead fish passage. Correct. Uh, well, yeah, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and Councilwoman Falcone, uh, the, the pass through agreement was negotiated prior to the three foot extension of, of the dam, which was done for environmental purposes. And so right. our pass through agreement has to do with how do you distribute the existing capacity of the Kachuma water that the Kachuma Operations Management Board deals with. Right. But I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, if we do lose the capacity at Gibraltar, and if we are going to need to physically retain more water in Kachuma, can we can we do that legally? And I think my answer to that, Councilwoman Falcone, is that's something I think we're all going to have to look at because the that's pass-through agreement question. doesn't necessarily increase the storage capacity of Kachuma. Right, it just ensures our rights. And so what I'm, as Gibraltar fills up, right. we're going to be dealing with a less total supply of water for the South Coast. And why we store water is irrelevant to the capacity issue that we need to, <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the question that I'm asking. Okay. Um, so you don't know. <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you. Stay tuned. Correct. That's right. Okay. Any other questions about the water? Okay. Let's go to the other W here. The final W. Wastewater fund. Uh, wastewater collection system, the Elastero treatment plant, and then laboratory analysis kind of make up the key functions of the wastewater fund. Again, not a lot of budget changes. We had a planned 6% rate increase in the wastewater fund that we still recommend going forward with, as does the Water Commission. And included in that is the uh, additional support for the highly successful sewer lateral inspection program. Uh, we've been to you with the status report on that. This is where uh, private property owners, if they're going to replace their uh, broken sewer lateral, we can provide matching funds from the wastewater fund to help defer the financial cost to try to uh, improve the number of private laterals that we have in the city in a more expeditious manner. And it's exceeded all of our expectations about how frequently that program would be used, which is good. And uh, we kept waiting to see if it would slow down, and it hasn't. And so financially, we need to keep up with the demand. And so uh, that's why we're asking for the increased operating budget. And we're also asking for uh, an administrative staff to support it, because there's a lot of work that goes in supporting the program, and to reclassify a coordinator position up to a supervisor position to kind of oversee this program. This, uh, is not, this, this increase you're talking about here is on top of the one that we just uh, not too long ago gave. Correct. For that was for the remainder of fiscal year 09, okay. 08, and then this would be for fiscal year 09. Okay. Mr. Horton also has a question. Uh, Paul, in D103, I was expecting in the bottom three uh, P3s, I was expecting to see those numbers jump up for the reasons that you just said, but they don't. Do you know why? I'll let John answer that first. Uh, yeah, I'll let John answer that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, called good, passing the buck. Exactly. There you go. No, good okay. delegating. That was a pause. Good Cal delegation. Councilmember Horton, could you be a little bit more specific? Uh, sure. The last three criteria on P3s on page D103 deal with laterals, and I, I expected the numbers would change. But they're flat. Are we on the same page here? Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, the numbers that we're actually um, have experienced for um, number of repairs and number of replacements, it's it's kind of difficult to separate uh, those two because what we'll do is um, a lot of them will be replaced, some of them will be repaired, so um, it's difficult to. Um, um, I guess to separate those two and to judge which which is going to go which way, but I think we we expect it to go up a little bit also, and we have been seeing it go up. Um, right now we're looking at you know a number of repairs closer to 215 repairs, of which 100 are replacements. So and that's just through this year, through this through May of. Yeah, I thought we just approved more money for that. So. Wouldn't you do more work then, or right? Most of the most of the money went towards the incentives, um, and then we have been supplementing our staff by using uh, temporary uh, employment help, and then also um, 
um, using um, crew that have been on modified work duty to try and work in that place. So what the additional money actually does is get us back to a point where we can do um, more um, of the work that we're supposed to be doing. If you look at some of our other P3 um, obligations, they've actually gone down. And we haven't done our manhole inspections that we have. We done, haven't done a few other things. So we've, we've shifted our priority to the SLIP program to make sure that it continues to run and we've neglected a couple of the other items. So that's why I think you're seeing some question from the Schneider. So the additional money was more for um, inspection, not necessarily, and, there, and, and so they, they checked their lateral, got reimbursed for the inspection, found it was okay. Because I think what Mr. Horton is trying to say is if we put more money into it, it meant that there was more demand because more people were interested in replacing or or repairing their sewer lateral, and yet the numbers here haven't changed from a year ago when we put the P3 together. Unless the money that we added was just so people can inspect them and they found that they're working properly, which means that the number would be flat for repairing sewer laterals. I think and is that what and Councilwoman Schneider, we also made a mid-year adjustment to the P3 numbers once we had a reflection. I think if we had the chance to go back and look what we were saying a year or two ago, you would see that that number was lower, but as we go through the P3s, we update them as appropriate. And so we can check that and get back right. to you and kind of give you information about that. And in fact, maybe I'll, I'll just recommend that since we don't have it at our fingertips. Why don't we get back okay. to the council That's good. and show them. Something that I might want to bring is that it did start in 2007. We had six months to it. So what we ended up doing was adding, um, changing our P3s at that six month um, um, time period to reflect what we thought would go through the, the rest of the year. So okay. we've we'll really been forward, at it for a year and a half. We'll look forward to, to, to some sort of report from you because I think that would be good to address the expectations of council with the in increases. And Ms. Falcone? Well, just a little clarification on that, that, that the answer for why that more money is, is both. Yes, more people than we expected are getting their sewer laterals inspected, which is something people don't think about doing ever anyway. So what, even if they find out that it's okay and they get reimbursed for the inspection, there's a mapping that's going on as well uh, that people are, are um, where are they good and where are they bad? Because in the sewer system, we could inspect our pipes, but we could never inspect the private pipes. So this is allowing us to do some mapping. But the program proved to be so popular that they ran through the money faster than expected. When we did the money over at the, at the Water Commission, when, we, when Ms. Bjork suggested a particular amount, nobody really thought that it was going to be as successful and, and go through it quite as quickly. Hence, the money before and now the money the additional money. The P3 number is the same in the big book than it is in the, in the year two book. And like I H3 said, let, change. Yeah. let us get better information back to you on that specific question. All right, good. That's why we have these meetings. Okay, we'll good. get back to you. We'll look forward to that. <laughs> Carry on. Thank you. Uh, key performance objectives, limit overflows during our sewer system to less than 15 per year, comply with all permits, provide accurate laboratory analysis, which is uh, good that we have our own on-site laboratory there at Ellis Darrow. Uh, inspect up to 120 restaurants for their grease trap maintenance, clean 200 miles of the collection system, and continue implementation of the sewer lateral. We're also completing the $18.5 million bond that uh, you issued, I think, about four years or so ago, and have been able to really uh, get some good capital improvements in there, like the activated sludge aeration basins and the secondary clarifier rehabilitation and the, and the Spring Street sewer. Uh, improvements as well. It's you know, really Paul, having, work. go back to that picture for a second, having those workers in there is really good. I've seen that slide or slides like this, uh, you know, for, before for your presentations, and, and I just forgot the scale of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, to have those workers in there to see how large those, uh, they're, they're, the, they're, they're the clarifiers, right? That's, yeah, that's just un unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. 
And then some of the significant projects for next year, continuing the sewer main replacement program. Uh, we're going to be completing a comprehensive sewer collection model. It's something we've been working on a couple of years now and getting a really good comprehensive model uh, of our sewer system, which has already saved us money. It's identified some areas where we had a capital program uh, targeted that looking at it from the model's perspective, we didn't need to do. And so it, it's already paid for itself in that regard, and we'll be able to finish that up. Uh, continue to evaluate the plant air system for energy efficiency again, and complete the asset management system. That's something John and his crews down there are doing a really good job of getting a comprehensive handle on all of the nuts and bolts and parts down there at El Estero and, and getting a management system for its replacement. So we're a little more proactive rather than just reacting when something breaks. So that concludes the wastewater fund. If there are any, any additional questions, questions, questions on that. that, and we will get you more information okay. on the sewer lateral Great, information. And then, if I could just finally wrap up on one of your council goals that was included in your budget document this year was on sustainability efforts. And I just kind of—I'm not going to go through this at all, but uh, your public works department and all the different funds is really kind of in the forefront and leading uh, the way on a lot of these sustainability efforts. And whether it's Jim Dewey and his energy programs. Or also the water and wastewater, looking at innovative ways of saving energy and doing business and conserving water and all those other things. Uh, we just have a big chunk of that. But in the interest of time, I will wrap up and answer any final questions you might have. Anything else for Mr. Casey, Public Works, and his team? Great. Thank you very much. Thank Great you. report. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break here while everybody else gets set up, and we'll move on to the Community Development Department. that we're looking forward to and we have lots of our program managers back here to answer those tough questions as well so Michelle DeCant will begin for you. Okay, Ms. DeCant. Thank you Dave. As Dave start, stated this is the summary of our presentation is our department overview general fund then looking at our other funds within our department P3 and our major highlights. We have 89 employees they're made up of six managers 12 supervisors and then the rest are our general employees we have four divisions within the Community Development Department, and we have 16 P3 programs. For fiscal year 09, we have increased by one program, which is the official budgetary uh, staff hearing officer environmental review and training program. In 09, it will actually have its own budgetary type program. This is a quick org chart of how we uh, lay out with our four programs, and the arts program and economic development are funded through administration. And then this chart is our expenditures by division, and it does look a little cattywonky there. First, I want to point out that in administration, that budget includes the arts budget, which is almost $600,000. In the housing and redevelopment, the reason it's such a huge slice is because that includes all of the RD redevelopment agency funds. It includes the human services funds, all of the CDBG grants and funds, the affordable housing and so if we actually took a lot of that out, the expenditures for housing and redevelopment would be closer to the two to three million dollars like our other programs. And now let's just talk strictly general fund budget. This pie chart shows our revenues and um, generally we have fees and service charges. We have a small amount of revenue for our admin citation. The inner fund reimbursement pie, the red pie, that is the RDA and housing salaries that are paid back to the general fund, and then we do have a subsidy level. This chart here shows what changed from fiscal year 08 amended to what we're proposing for 2009. And our fees and service charges have gone up slightly, and I will be discussing our fees later on in the presentation. General fund subsidy actually went down slightly. The inner fund reimbursement, that is up 14%. And what that includes in there is the new redevelopment specialist, which just recently was approved, and it's showing up in the 09 proposed, as well as just increases in salary and benefits, and then no changes on our admin citation at this time. This pie chart shows our expenditures and community development, similar to just about all the other programs or departments, where we're mostly salary and benefits, and then we have the other types of items as supplies and equipment. It does show here the arts program, which is almost $600,000, which just came into our budget this fiscal year, and then the human services program. 
This chart here shows the changes, what happened in our expenditures from our amended 08 to what we're proposing. And as you can see, salaries and benefits did go up. Supplies and services does look weird there, so let me explain that. Even though this is the general fund budget, Plan Santa Barbara, which those monies are in a separate fund, it's a temporary fund, so we actually show those funds in our general fund presentation. And as you know, Plan Santa Barbara has a lot of professional services. We just recently did the you know, million dollar EIR contract. And so those are what all of those professional services were up front with the Plan Santa Barbara budget, and that's what's in the amended column, and that's why it makes that supplies and services line look a little odd, but that's the explanation for that. Human services has gone up, and it actually, just so you know, has gone up the 8.6% that was approved by council, and the reason why it's only shown 3.5 is because those numbers also include the homeless outreach uh, special one-time monies that you gave in fiscal year 08. It also includes the homeless winter shelter funds. And so when you put those numbers in there, it makes it look like human services is only going up 3.5%, but in essence, human services grants that are available really are 8.6% increased. The arts program for fiscal year 09 has just gone down slightly, and it's $6,600. When we brought that program into community development for fiscal year 08, there was that amount of money, that $6,000, that was for the preparation of the walls of City Hall to make it an art gallery. Our transfer out is um, slightly down. Special projects, again, slightly down, and equipment is slightly down. These are our contingency adjustments that we're proposing for fiscal year 09. They're in our priority order. The first two is where we're moving part of some FTEs into the redevelopment agency budget. And it's actually additional parts where we look at our people and where they're doing their level of work and the effort of work. And when we're looking at our contingencies, you know, we double checked on this. Is this appropriate? And if their work is being done in these programs, this is where their, their effort should be recorded. On number three and five, you'll notice we're holding one and a half positions um, open for fiscal year 09. They're currently vacant at this time. They're, both of those positions are in the building and safety division. We're reducing our special projects accounts uh, slightly. And then I'm going to talk more about this. Um, what we are going to, or we do have a proposal to increase planning fees an additional 10% above what was originally submitted for our fiscal year 09 plan. I wanted to put this slide up here just to give council a heads up. We have a couple major items that are unfunded. They're not in our proposed 09 plan, and these are two of them. The first one, I believe you're, you're familiar with both of them, the opinion poll for Plan Santa Barbara. We're estimating that to be about thirty to $50,000. We're in the process of working on that, and we expect to be before council in the next couple of months on that particular item. Then the Outer State Street Design Guidelines, I believe you heard in detail at your recent Joint Planning Commission Council meeting on this from Betty Weiss, is that that is an on-hold item. We don't know when that might be coming forward. It could be 2010 or later. I understand that, Council, you were interested more first in the transportation type of um, issues. Oops. <laughs> Mr. Horton. I think that's not right. Uh, I think we just had a meeting on that yesterday on the Outer State Street study, and I think the specifications are pretty much ready to go according to the meeting we just had. Am I wrong on that? Because we're waiting on these for the transit study that Public Works is, hand, is working on. Mr. Mayor, is, yes, that's what uh, our understanding was that we were going to delay the design guidelines until we had made some progress on the transit corridor study. And is that what you're referring yeah. to, the transit corridor study? Right. Yeah, which is being coordinated with Public Works. But that that's almost ready to roll out, isn't it? Aren't the specifications? I don't know the details of it. Probably Public Works could tell us better, but we're not proposing to begin the design guidelines <laughs> until that's been resolved. So that's oh, okay. the delay. Thank you. May I ask uh, one Stockton? question on that? Just, all, there were certain unknown numbers when the transit study that 
uh, reiterate I voted against, but whether, but what the number of that study was going to be, and it was bandied about anywhere from 200 to $500,000 that it was going to cost. Do we have a better number on that now? And can I know what that, what that is? And, and whether or not, uh, I mean, we don't want to wait until 2010 for the Out of State Street. We we have Mr. Casey here to help answer the, the question here. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Falcone and Horton. We were at Council back in September to move forward with the Outer State Street Design Guidelines. Right. Council said, let's hold off. We want to look at a transit study. We came back with a proposed scope of work to make sure we were kind of on target. We didn't know how much it was going to cost, and so we threw out numbers. And you directed us to go release a request for proposal, which we've done, and to bring that back to Finance Committee and then Council to decide whether to go forward or not. Uh, we've got two proposals in. We're prepared to get on a Finance Committee agenda in the next month or so. It's more in the ballpark of about $200,000 no. to give you a heads up to be thinking Good. about it. And then it'll be up to Council to decide to go forward with that study uh, and complete that or not. And I think what Michelle is saying here is if you don't and we want to get going on the outer State Street design guidelines, we still have to fund that as well. Okay. And I, I think what raised the eyebrows was the 2010 or later and that kind of speaking made it seem like it was just getting put way off or something. I think basically it's contingent on one thing follows another and we're moving ahead with the first piece of the puzzle, right? We completely agree. That's right. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, Ms. DeCant, please continue. Thank you. Now I want to talk about the general, the general fund fees. We have a number of different categories of fees, and we have planning and transportation type fees, and they support the planning division as well as transportation planning. This section of fees, some of them are close to full cost recovery. Some of them are very, very low. And when we do fee increases, it's really to just help to reduce our general fund subsidy on this set of fees. And all of our fees across the board were actually proposing an original 10% fee increase where it was for fiscal year 09. But then with this contingency plan, we are proposing another 10%, so the total will be a 20% fee increase. The land development team is another section of fees that we have. And just to explain how those work, these fees deal with three different departments, community development planning, public works transportation planning and engineering, as well as fire prevention. When the fees are paid, they're actually divvied out to the various departments. Back in 2004, when we did a study, as most of you will recall, our recovery level was incredibly low. It was under 9%. And the city was subsidizing nine, over 90% of the cost of doing these land development type activities. And at that time, council did set a policy to try to get up to about a 30% cost recovery level. And we knew it would take a number of years to get us there. So around 2008, and for this fiscal year, with the proposed fee increases, we're actually at about a 32% cost recovery level. And now that we're there for 2009, this may be the time to consider, do we want to look at a new policy goal of um, increasing that recovery level and reducing the subsidy level um, from the general fund? You would be bringing to us then the, the uh, comparative uh, agencies like you had done before um, to see where we stand with other similar cities and that kind of thing. So we'd be looking at uh, where, where we are, relatively speaking. Mr. House, yes, that's actually probably my next slide which you've seen these before. And so I have a number of slides. We put this up here. Uh, it's, it's, again, this particular chart is land development team fees only. And it's showing our current fee and with this 20% proposal, what our fees would be. And we are getting onto the higher end of our neighboring jurisdictions, not in every fee. We do have a staff intensive process. It was set out that we were only gonna do that original 30% cost recovery because the benefit to the general public for the good work that the community development de department does, you know, that you have to weigh both of that. So this was a chart we show it every year of just looking at some of our neighboring jurisdictions. And the next chart shows for just the local south coast. And again, this one, it's hard when you do to compare for trying to get apples to apples because the three items on the right, those are deposits only where we just charge a fee and that's it. 
So even if it costs for, let's say, the development plan $20,000 to do that, we charge the fee and that's where it stops, where these other jurisdictions have deposits and then they bill against that deposit until the project is done. Building and safety fees is our next level of fees. a question fees. here. Uh, Wait a minute. From Mr. Horton. I'm oh, uh, sorry. But the full cost comparison chart, do you not have that one? That will be coming in the building and safety fee presentation, which is coming up. Okay, because I think it's a little misleading to show the one chart of the comparative fees within the comparative cities and not show the full cost comparison in the same sequence, you know, because it's quite a bit different when you see the full cost. It is. Mr. Gus. Mayor House, Member Horton, are, are you asking for more information about the what would be the full cost recovery on those other jurisdictions? Well, when we, in finance, we looked at this yesterday, uh -huh. and, and the when you look at the full cost, which just includes the impact fees, right. then it puts an entirely different oh. picture on the whole thing. So we'll that, that's the only reason I mentioned that, because sure. if you just see the one. Yep. You'll see that same chart just as you did yesterday. I, I was just wanting to be sure that that it was understood that we don't know what the full cost recovery would turn out to be on any of those in the other jurisdictions because it is what it is. No, but I understand that. But if having the two tables next to each other gives you a better picture of what it would actually cost to do a project here versus Ventura. And you'll have, Seems those, like. you'll have those very shortly, and we can flip back and forth between them as much as you'd like. It was it's still a little bit surprising to see the ones that you're showing here because the ones that I had seen previously, um, even with our last round of, of, of increases, we were substantially below other jurisdictions. And so I, I'm going to go back and see if I can hunt down that, uh, that chart and compare it to what you are going to present to us next. Okay, thank you. Okay. And last year we did show this, and um, I, do ha I don't have it with me, but the, we were starting at that time to creep up and get on the higher end, even last fiscal year. So I'm going to go into. But, but I think it's really important to emphasize that these are deposits, and they charge. They get 100 percent recovery, so right. they 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 all they allocate 100 percent of their costs. So even with ours, you know, and, and these are just the deposits they pay. Okay. Building and safety fees. We're going to get there. These fees are support the building and safety functions and cost, and historically we've had these fees closer to the full cost recovery for the building and safety division. And we are looking at increasing these fees in fiscal year 2009. Um, the fee will be going up, or we're proposing a 10 percent fee increase, and that's helping to keep us at a, a full cost recovery. We, as you saw, we also are working to help uh, lower some of our costs. We've held some of those positions open. Activity is down, as you all are aware. And I know through the Finance Committee reviews that our, you know that we're not quite meeting our revenues. Activity is, is down. We're still busy, but some of the activity is down, as you are very well aware of that. So here's the chart that you were looking for. This is our sample project, and this, sh this chart shows all of the different fees. So it includes the planning fees, the building permit fee. It includes the LDT recovery fee, which is a new fee that was just implemented this past year, as well as some others. And I want to point out before the members of the Finance Committee question this, so we did change one number. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Uh, we looked at the building permit number, and, the, and uh, based on our analysis, the original forty or some thousand dollar number that you saw was if we were building four custom homes. And uh, looking at this, actually, it's more appropriate looking at it as a four lot subdivision, where these are more of a track home. As you notice, we're still, even with our fee increases, still woefully low of our other jurisdictions. And the basic reason, like we've pointed out every year, is that we don't have impact fees. And I wanted to let you know, because we did talk about this last fiscal year, is uh, where we're at on a study with that. And so we did hire a consultant, and the consultant has made a presentation to the Infrastructure Financing Task Force, I believe just last week. His presentation was entitled, Overview of Infrastructure Financing Techniques and Developer Fees. And that presentation, the next steps will be going to the Planning Commission for their review. And then eventually this will be um, part of the Plan Santa Barbara effort of looking at developer fees, impact fees, and that type of thing. And so we will be addressing impact fees in this coming fiscal year. Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Buckland. Just looking at, and, and I didn't, 
Again, I'm sorry, I didn't have the benefit of the Finance Committee meeting yesterday. But your premise is a four-lot subdivision with four new houses, each approximately 2,500 square feet, plus a 500 square foot garage. And then you have valid, valued at $290,500? Right. Where? Where? <laughs> Yeah, that should have wow. been, yeah, that amount could have been updated. The, the County of Santa Barbara Carton, I believe it's um, Carpinteria, their fees have not gone up, but um, per George Estrella, the building official, he's talked with both of those, and they are looking at revising their fee structure. And so when we presented this chart a year ago, that was at the valued rate. And so this year, all I did was actually update our Santa Barbara fees because their fees haven't changed. But a a a a, a two thousand five hundred square foot house with a five hundred square foot garage, anywhere on the south coast is going to start in the six hundreds. So I don't know if that affects your calculations of your impact fees. Maybe that number is irrelevant. But George, yes, sir. Let's see how that pieces together. So George is today a chief yes, building official. Actually, uh, I'm first going to say it's very difficult to have a cost analysis with various jurisdictions. Uh, the three other jurisdictions, first of all, use a valuation table as established by the Inter International Code Council, where we in Santa Barbara use a fees for service fully burden rate. It's a completely different fee structure. And so you're right, um, um, uh, Council Member Falcone, if you take a look at this structure, uh, I, do, I do not believe it would be built for 290500 That's just kind of an example. So if, if you use that figure and apply it to the valuation tables, that is what those jurisdictions would be charging. Where we do not use a valuation of a project, we use hours, we use data, we use fees for services and a matrix schedule to establish, a, to establish our uh, permit fees. And actually, if you take a look at them, even from a valuation table as compared to ours, we're slightly higher. We are. Uh, but there's no question that you probably will not get four <laughs> or a, a single, single family dwelling at 2,400 square feet with a 500 square foot garage built for $290,000, uh, 500 in Santa Barbara. Mr. Uh, Ms. I Schneider think, would I like think to the ask the point is it's not what you buy it for. That's how much it costs to build it. That's the value number, not it, it was the market a, it was number, number if you wanted to buy a 2,500 yeah, square foot. it's not a correct value number right, under any right. circumstances. Well, so. you're, you're correct, Council Member Schneider. There are two ways to compute, and one of them is what is the hard cost of to build, and the other is evaluation factor that is used in determining permit fees. Again, it depends on how you're applying uh, And so the value, the, the value of, a, of a, it being cost the value to build it is not what we use as part of our formula and our calculation. We in Santa Barbara, but the comparable jurisdictions do. So we, in, under no circumstances, are ever going to get to apples to apples here. Correct. Thank absolutely. You. You're absolutely right. But one of the takeaways from this conversation is we don't have impact fees. They do. I mean, at, at this point. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. And this is the last slide I have for the general fund, and let me confuse you just a little bit more. We, you, in front of you, or submitted with the budget, was a fee resolution. And we had, uh, you know, our resolution showed our fee increases. We had a change to one of our particular fees in the ABR and HLC, and it included the supplemental review fee. And that is when projects come back to the ABR HLC over and over and over and over again. And at the time, Larger projects obviously pay larger money. Smaller projects pay smaller amounts of money. And the fee at that time was after your fourth review, because we felt the fee included two concepts, a preliminary and a final, you would start paying one quarter of your current fee. For smaller projects, that could be OK. For larger projects, paying a quarter of that fee got quite substantial when your original fees are already at perhaps $17,000. So we proposed a different fee, and we split the projects up between larger and smaller projects. And for the larger projects, we felt the fee included about seven reviews. And so on a larger project on your eighth review, you needed to start paying. Because at that point, something's going on. Either you're not being responsive to the board, the board could 
you know, we hear those complaints that the board's not right. Or, you know, projects sometimes just warrant appropriate, uh, you know, multiple reviews. So we proposed a fee of $200 per meeting for these larger projects once they get over their seven reviews. And then for the smaller projects at their fifth or subsequent review, also 200 uh, reviews, or $200. And uh, Betty Weiss, the city planner, did take our budget proposal to the ABR HLC and sign committee and, um, sh you know, somewhat to the PC with your joint meeting. And one of the feedback, or some of the feedback that we got was on this particular fee. And they felt it was good for the eighth, but they I would have liked to have seen where for the smaller projects to go back to the quarter of the current fee for the smaller type projects. And so finance requested that this we bring this forward to you since the fee resolution is already in your hands. And we just wanted to let you know that this was one change to our current fee resolution that we wanted to propose. And that will be coming to us when do you think? Um, sometime this next fiscal year or within the next few months? Or? No, when, when the council is asked to adopt the budget, we always bring you a, a new I fee see. resolution. Okay. And we had already proposed this, and this is just a one little change to what we originally proposed to you okay. based upon input from those uh, bonds. It will be part of the agenda when we finalize the budget. That's correct. Okay. Okay. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brian Bossi to discuss the rest of our funds in the Community Development Department. Mr. Bossi? Good afternoon, Mayor House and agency board members. Uh, I'm going to take you through the Housing and Redevelopment uh, Division's budget. Uh, today I'll be reviewing with you the following funds, uh, the agency's general operating fund, our housing fund, our agent, the agency's capital fund, and then I'm going to move on into uh, CDBG. Just a quick rehash. Uh, this is our central city redevelopment project area, um, Victoria, just boundary-wise, Victoria Street on the north, the 101 in Castillo uh, to your left. I'm not going to go with directions because Santa Barbara's a little cockeyed here. So uh, on the lower part, we have the harbor and along Cabrillo Boulevard. Um, over on the far right, we come up Milpas along the 101 again and then back up Santa Barbara Street to uh, Victoria Street. Approximately 850 acres. Um, it was adopted in 1972. It was activated in 1977. And as of right now, uh, the project area sunsets or expires in 2015 with the ability to collect, collect tax increment out into 2025. Um, but uh, the project area has been quite successful and we plan on it, uh, reaching that, that uh, maximum tax increment around 2018 or 2019. So with that, I'll work us into our general fund. Um, again, this is our general operating fund. The primary sources of revenue, uh, primary re resource or source of revenue is our tax increment. And this year we are projecting a conservative tax increment growth of about 4%. This chart here gives you an idea of what the last uh, five years has held for us. Um, it, it varies, obviously, from year to year, but one thing that is good is it continues to grow. Um, not, not as grand as before, but it does continue to grow. Um, fiscal year 09, we're anticipating a little over $18 million in total tax increment. And as you know, uh, according to state law, that's split up 80% uh, to redevelopment activities and 20% to affordable housing activities. In fiscal year 09, for the 20% for, for affordable housing amounts to a little over $3.6 million. And also, as you are well aware, your board has been very uh, generous and realizes the importance of the affordable housing component and has often gone beyond that 20% that threshold uh, on a regular basis. Okay, here uh, is our pie chart for revenues for Fund 111. As you can see, I, I wasn't lying. The overwhelming uh, source of revenue for that is our tax increment. Um, this is the 80% version. So we'll get to the housing in a bit, but this is the 80% for redevelopment activities. Little uh, about $14.4 million. Uh, we have our interest income there. Uh, a little bit in loans and rents, and then a small sliver of miscellaneous items, um, which are adjustments, uh, city adjustments for workers' comp and uh, uh, other assorted re rebates from the city. The chart we have for you, comparing uh, fiscal year 2008 and what we're proposing for fiscal year 2009. Um, again, tax increment, a 4% increase. Our interest income is um, 
we're projecting it's going to go down a little. Um, the economy, as you know, is not, not real strong. We're projecting that to go down about 20 percent. Our loans and rents uh, will stay steady. Um, and again, there's our miscellaneous sliver of a little over $1,300 uh, total of about $14,668,000. Uh, revenue growth from the from the prior year is up a little over five hundred thousand dollars. Our expenditures pie chart. Um, first off is our debt service, and that is that takes into account all of the previous tax allocation bonds, a little over seven and a half million dollars. Our operating expenses include our salaries, benefits, supplies, and services. Our special expenses up there, upper left, the orange slice, um, include things such as our uh, funding a portion of the shuttle bus contract, which is a downtown mitigation measure for the redevelopment agency uh, for all the activity we do in the downtown. Um, we also have uh, property management obligations with the numerous properties that the agency holds, uh, as well as uh, hazardous materials, uh, a hazardous materials account to fund studies and um, different requests made by the Regional Water Quality Control Board on a number of our properties. Our operate, I went over operating, operating reserves, 80 uh, percent, that's steady with fiscal year uh, 2008. And the number on the left is what is available for future projects and programs, and that's a little over $4.6 million. Uh, looking at our, our chart comparing fiscal year 2008 and 2009, our operating expenses have gone up by about two point, uh, sorry, 10.2 percent. Um, those, the, the primary reason for that, or primary reasons I should say, are the addition of a new, re the addition of a new redevelopment uh, specialist, as well as, as, as Ms. Decan alluded to, some reapportionment of certain people's um, pay. So uh, that a lot of that, some of that went into housing, some of that also went into the redevelopment agency. Our special projects. Um, a little bit deceiving. It has gone down on the chart there by about 25 percent. I should let you know that the fiscal year 2008, a good portion of that was about a little over $200,000 was a carryover from fiscal year 07 into 08. So what you see in 09 is just what is currently proposed for 09. There will likely be a rollover from 08 into 09. Our debt service uh, went up a, a little bit. Um, available for future projects and programs of 4.6. Operating reserves, as I said, steady, and grants, um, quite a significant decrease, but that's a little deceiving as well. Uh, last year, as you recall, um, the agency board um, went out and we did a community grant process and uh, granted right at a million dollars. So what, what you're seeing there is about $2.7 million from previous grant cycles. Those projects are still working, so that was carried over um, into 08. Um, two numbers that, that I'm sure you want to focus on here are the, the available for future projects and programs as well as the grant funds. And if I can touch on those real quick. Um, first of all, uh, as we all know, uh, Sacramento is having some budget issues. Um, and noting um, their process for dealing with those budget issues in the past, um, they routinely come after redevelopment agencies for funding. Uh, the, the most recent uh, times they came and took money from our redevelopment agency was in fiscal year 05 to the tune of about $1.3 million and fiscal year 06 to the tune of about $1.2 million. Noting um, their habits, we fully anticipate uh, that they will be coming again back at the redevelopment agency. We discussed this with you at a work session in late January that, that all signs pointed towards that. and. Um, with your direction, uh, we went back and uh, it was you directed us to hold off on funding new capital projects as well as new community grants. Um, and that zero, just to let you know, over, since 1992, realizing the importance of the cultural arts community, um, your board has granted over $13.5 million to local community arts organizations, which is uh, quite a bit of money and it's made quite a bit of difference out there. So that's a, a quick discussion on our expenditures. Moving into our affordable housing fund, um, lower, lower right, our total revenue is a little over $3.9 million. Uh, the majority of that as well comes from tax increment. That's that 20 percent I spoke of earlier. Uh, loan repayments, about $160,000. Interest income, 
$150,000, and then miscellaneous, again, uh, a few rebates here and there from the city for informational information services and workers' comp and things of that nature. The comparison chart between 08 and 09, um, as you can see, tax increment up by 4%. Interest income similar to the redevelopment side of things uh, down. $50,000 for projecting down $50,000. Again, just being conservative. Our loan repayments uh, remain uh, static. And again, there's our, our $534. As far as expenditures, uh, available for future projects, uh, $2.3 million. Um, our operating reserve of, of $80,000, which is similar uh, to 2008. Our debt service, and that covers the, the tax allocation housing bond that was issued in 2004, a little over $7 million primarily for the St. Vincent's property or development. Um, that's the $636,000. And operating expenses of $870,000. We have a question here for you, uh, Mr. Horton. Yes. Brian, on uh, page D19, at the bottom, the um, projected new affordable units, 12. What? Are we, are we on the same chart here? Do you know what those would be? I'm, I'm going to de defer to Mr. Gustafson on this one. Thank you, uh, Mayor House and, and uh, Councilman Horton. Those are units that are in our um, workforce housing supply of for sale units. And the exactions that we get for um, on the inclusionary housing program for those projects. So those are units that we would anticipate would become available for sale to that category of income. So that would be um, units like under construction at the present time or something like that? In, yes, an example would be Chapala 1. Yeah, okay. Okay, question from Ms. Schneider. Well, I, I just want to put that in context. It came, the Plan Santa Barbara workshops where they were looking at in the future, looking at a um, historical average of 100 housing units built per year. And so we're saying, let's say in 2008, 11 our workforce housing units. So then are we saying 11% of the 11 percent of new housing units coming online go towards our workforce housing? Because that's, no, Betty's going like this. I guess maybe not here, but at some point I'd like to see how that fits because um, that seems like a significant number, even though the number 11 is not significant, but as a percentage of new housing units coming online, if we're saying 11% of it comes through our inclusionary housing process, that seems a lot, but perhaps that's something that can come back. Um, yeah, we'll come back with more information for you, uh, Member Schneider, but I also would point out that when we have achieved 100 housing units per year over the past several years, the great percentage of them have been affordable housing units. Well, that, but that's low and very low and moderate. Right. So that, that's a whole different category. Right. This is more the middle income and upper middle income category. It, it is, and it's, and it's our goal. And as the market changes, and we maybe see the slowdown on the mixed use projects that are treated under the inclusionary housing ordinance, this number may drop. So. You know, it, it could be that we'll, re, we'll realize less than that, okay. that number. Okay, so this just may be a spike, a current a, spike, but not uh, annual. It's a historical annualized. expectation what we've been able to do, but we may have to modify our expectations when we okay. see what's happening in the market. Thank you. Okay, uh, here we are with the uh, total available agency housing funds uh, from the top. Available for projects and programs in fiscal year 2009. That was the number I showed you, a little over $2.3 million. Um, going back to fiscal year 2008, uh, we had approximately $4.4 .4 million. The agency board, um, a number of years back, set aside uh, a housing contingency fund. Currently, that has a little over $1.5 million. As, and they also uh, put out an opportunity acquisition fund, and that currently has a little over $366,000 for a total of just over $8.6 million. Let me grab you for a second there. Now, yep. um, we haven't yet collected, I don't believe, any in lieu fees based on our inclusionary housing uh, ordinance, but if we did, would it go into one of these funds here, or does it go somewhere else? 
Um, uh, Mayor House, if, if we collect those in lieu fees, they're going to be really critical to our ability to um, monitor compliance uh, with the, those workforce housing units that we want to preserve. And that's going to be a significant expense. One of the things that we've done with workforce housing units in the past that didn't exceed 120 percent of median income is that we've used redevelopment agency funds to um, buy those units out of foreclosure to preserve them and then make them available, fix them up, make them available for another eligible buyer. We're constrained by housing and redevelopment law to do so for income categories of housing above 120 percent, and we don't have a ready source of revenues to do that same thing for those units. Mm -hmm. So we would be strongly recommending to you, and the inclusionary housing ordinance is scheduled to come back to you mm -hmm. in, uh, in the next month or so, we'd be recommending that you when you realize in lieu revenues from, the, from those kinds of things, that a portion of that be used to be able to preserve the units and cover the staff costs and the acquisition costs on, on foreclosures. Mm -hmm. And we discussed that at ordinance. And, um, but where, when, when you say used, what, where does it go? Does it go into one of these funds here, or does it go into a general operating fund? or where, how, is, how, how will that be? I, th I, th I think we'll just set up another fund that specifically tracks those funds for that purpose. Okay, very good, because it has a special yes. allowance to be used for these things, which the other funds can't be. Yes, as distinct okay. from the housing contingency fund, which is the redevelopment tax increment money, 20 percent set aside, that has to be used for 120 percent and below. Okay, so very good. Ms. Falcone, okay, Ms. Falcone has a question, I think. Thank you. To, and to build on that just a little bit for clarity's sake, these in lieu fees that are proposed in the new proposed inclusionary housing ordinance, this is not yet adopted, it's still in its proposed stage, so we don't have include, we don't really have in lieu fees at this point, we're proposing them. Yes, we do. Well, we do. We do, but, but we haven't but collected them yet. We haven't yes. collected them. But this is a different sort of structure. This is much more. I mean, it's much heavier and weightier, more money, more of an extraction. Um, if I understand what you're saying is that although th there is there is a notion that the in lieu fees would be collected in a fund to be able to then build more classic affordable housing, the very low, low, moderate, because it, it can't be used for workforce, so that's that it would be collected and put into a fund that would then grow and these in lieu fees would then be used to turn around and build more affordable housing. What I think I just heard you say and what I, how I understood the original concept was that this money that is collected by the in lieu fees, which is, you know, don't build a unit or don't build a portion of a unit or whatever, and you get the in lieu fees. So um, that is going to be used for monitoring the compliance, making sure that the workforce people that are qualified for the workforce housing are actually living there or if they default, we have a fund by which to buy it back. So these in lieu fees, from what I hear you say, are likely never going to be used to actually build new affordable housing. Well, Councilman Falcone, I think I overweighted that because that's the primary concern I have in my mind is how we're going to fund the preservation of the workforce housing units and the, the inclusionary housing ordinance amendments as we bring it back to you uh, those those housing types relate to the workforce housing units. So in terms of nexus, I think we would expect to take the in lieu fees and do some both of those things with them to to the where it was possible to use the funds to augment the workforce how production of workforce housing units. We do it, but we'd also carve out a portion of that to be able to fund our compliance uh, obligations and also to rescue units who are at risk of foreclosure. Okay, let me ask you this, though. You just said that you would take some of this money and augment a workforce housing project. Workforce housing, in my mind, is 120 and above. Is RDA money, which this ultimately is, allowed for that purpose? Um, Member Falcone, I... I think that I would make the distinction that, that apart from this chart that we're talking about, which is really the redevelopment agency money, mm -hmm. which is money used for 120 percent below mm -hmm. and below, 
when we're talking about an in-lieu fee and in inclusionary housing ordinance that we're going to bring back for your full consideration in the near future and we can make lots of choices about, we're not talking about redevelopment agency money. We're talking about money that is generated simply from our ordinance for uh, inclusionary housing and the imposition of an in-lieu fee, and therefore we're unfettered by the restrictions of use that we have with redevelopment agency money, and we can use that for two things, the production of additional workforce housing and the preservation of workforce housing. Okay, that specific legal issue I'd like to be fully researched because I hope you're right. Yeah, good. We'll certainly do that. We'll make sure that we have it fully understood when we bring it we back get to you. In trouble. Yep, thank you. Yeah. We're, we're all, those of us on ordinance are really excited about getting a chance to have that come to here. But that's not on our agenda today. But certainly we're, uh, I was just wondering where it would end up or how it would get there through what funnel. So I think I got my answer there. Um, and you ready to continue? Thank you. Okay, here we go. Um, where that money is uh, currently proposed to be going. This is our affordable housing projects. Uh, obligations and potential new projects. Um, you're very well. You're very familiar with the project uh, 512 to 518 Bass Street. It was before you about two weeks ago, I believe, um, uh, with where your agency board uh, approved a grant in, or a loan. I'm sorry, at 4.8 million dollars. The units uh, right now, the base density has that set at about 29 units. We anticipate that the housing authority is going to come back and, and, and request a significant bonus, possibly up to 50 um, small units. We also have the Hagen uh, printing site uh, currently proposed at 40 units and a subsidy amount of approximately $2.7 million. And the Transit Village, again, units to be determined. Uh, the subsidy amount at this time, the total subsidy amount, again, is, is to be determined. But I, I should let you know that uh, through past budget processes, uh, the agency board has set aside $2 million in affordable housing funds uh, for that particular project, as well as a $1 million in redevelopment agency funds that are currently being, being used for planning and, and looking into that, that project. Uh, and that totals uh, $7.5 million uh, for potential projects and obligations. A redevelopment agency capital program. Uh, current capital program includes 23 capital projects that total over $33.9 million, 11 community grants uh, totaling over $2.9 million. And again, those are just the ones that are still in the works. Since 92, you have put out more than $13.5 million to community grants. Uh, and that totals over a little over, well, not quite $37 million. Our funding sources. Our, our capital fund, um, and that, again, tax increment, as well as our 2001 bond and our 2003 tax allocation bond. A partial list of our current capital projects. Uh, we've got the Creole Recreation Center, West Downtown Improvements, uh, Fire Station 1 was recently before you and is looking to get started next month. Uh, we've got the West Beach Pedestrian in, uh, Improvements, which actually goes to the Planning Commission tomorrow. The Transit Village, our Cacique properties, and you can go on from there. Uh, historic rail car, East Cabrillo sidewalks, which is currently in construction, as, as are Plaza Veracruz Park. The Thompson Avenue improvements are hoping to wrap up in the next week or so. So there's a quick shot of our uh, capital projects. Now on to our community development block grant budget. And you are also very familiar with this and the wonderful process that Sue Gray and uh, Liz Stotts ran again this year. Um, CDBG program. It, we receive federal funds from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The primary goal of those funds, the usage of those funds, is to develop a viable urban community um, by providing decent housing and suitable living, a suitable living environment. Our funding categories in there, the three general funding categories, include public service, capital, as well as administration and fair housing. Total revenues to that fund are a little over $1.3 million, uh, including a little over a million dollars uh, in the entitlement. Our miscellaneous, again, is the rebate from the city for certain services, as well as uh, repayments of uh, approximately $250,000. Our comparison chart for between 08 and fiscal year 2009, our repayments uh, are going down uh, almost uh, 30%, and that's due to less uh, HRLP loan repayments, um, just less people involved in that program um, as it moves forward. 
um, our federal grants and entitlement. Um, this is a bit deceiving. It goes down 60 percent. But similar to some of the redevelopment agency funds, the, the number you see under fiscal year 2008 is uh, some carryover from projects that were previously approved or didn't get done or that were left over that rolled into that fiscal year 2008. So what you're seeing isn't quite apples to apples, but it is a true figure of what, what is in those uh, accounts. Mr. Bossy, if you did compare apples to apples there, not the carryover, but the other part, how do we compare to 2008? That is a good question. Um, Sue, can I ask Sue Gray to come up and, and give a quick? Mm -hmm. Hello, Ms. Gray. Hello. And Thank all the us. accolades are um, seconded by this <laughs> chair here. Thank you. For fiscal year 2008, our entitlement grant was reduced slightly. I believe it was around 3% reduction. And we're looking at, I think in one of the next slides, every year the administration projects a, a much larger reduction. I think it's 19% for, for fiscal year 2010. But it never, it hasn't in the past years, it's been level or slight reduction. And that's what we're planning on for 2010 also. So the actual entitlement went down, I think it was 3%. Okay. We thank our Congress people for their efforts on yes. behalf of the cities. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, and Michelle has just informed me that uh, that difference between 08 and 09 is a little over uh, $1.2 million, if you were to compare. Thank you. The Apple stuff. Um, okay. But, the carryover is mostly um, neighborhood improvement capital. Is that, I mean, it's not the grants, the human services grants, because they have to spend it, and there's a little bit of carryover. But it, that chunk of change, $1.2 is probably... Or is it city neighborhood improvement kind of capital expenditures? Is that right? Ms. Gray. Council Member Schneider, you're, you're correct. It is the capital projects and neighborhood improvement, the capital wins we give to the nonprofits. A really big chunk of it is also the housing rehab loan program. They're loans that they have out for their program. So all of those combined are shown in that number. Yeah. In the 08 number, yes. Thank you, Sue. As for expenditures, um, capital grants uh, nearing $900,000, our public services almost uh, $160,000, fair housing right at $100,000, and administration not quite $160,000 for total expenditures of a little over $1.3 million. A comparison chart between fiscal year 2008 and fiscal year 2009. You can see that uh, on the top of the chart, our salaries and benefits for that program have gone, gone down almost 24 percent, and that is the result of a decrease, uh, a staff reduction in the Rental Housing and Mediation Task Force uh, folks by one person, as well as a transfer of 25 percent um, that was formerly in that being paid by there into uh, the re redevelopment and housing funds, as we talked about before. So just a reappropriation of where people's time is being spent. We were approaching some of the limits on the administration uh, amounts, and so we reprogram that accordingly. Our supplies and services uh, have gone up not quite 10 percent. Our equipment costs, uh, 150 percent, but that amounts to about $1,700. That's for computers. Again, a little bit deceiving. Our capital outlay, a slight reduction, not quite four, a little over four hundred dollars. Our appropriated reserves, again, uh, have gone up slightly, about nine thousand dollars, and our housing and rehab loans have gone down to approximately four hundred. We're projecting four hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, as well as our grants, uh, down to a little over uh, four hundred thousand dollars. CDB, the CDBG program as a whole, uh, fiscal year 2009, have uh, been funded a level of a little over $1 million, $1,065,000. Uh, for fiscal year 2010, uh, this seems to be a regular occurrence. Um, the federal administration is proposing a 19% reduction. Uh, the funding level uh, for, uh, at this time for fiscal year 2010 is unknown. Um, it's a big question mark. Uh, our human services funds, which total $703,256, complement the, the CDBG public service funding. And as Michelle explained earlier in her presentation, that gets you to the 8.6% increase. 
And with that, I will hand it over to Mr. Gustafson. Thank you. We'll go back to me. Yes. Take it back just for a second. So um, one, of the, one of the big reductions in terms of uh, expense was the um, reduction of one rental mediation ca uh, s a staff member. And, um, and in a city with about 55% of its population being tenants, it seems like uh, a, a place that I just want to raise, you know, raise a flag of concern. And uh, the services they've provided have been um, uh, v so deeply and very much appreciated over the years and have resolved uh, so many disputes, it's uncountable. And of course, the, the huge savings in terms of, uh, to the tenants, of course, and to the landlords in terms of cost of litigation, it's just, uh, again, uh, uh, virtually uncountable. Um, so I want to just put a little um, asterisk next to that one as something that I'm certainly going to be looking at again uh, when this comes back around. And hopefully we might find some way to readjust and, and, uh, and, and find, or, or find another way to, to, to cover the same service. Maybe there's some other magical way to do it. But certainly that's been one that uh, I'd be very concerned to see go. Give you that feedback right now. Okay. Um, th thank you, Mary House. Actually, Michelle DeCamp is going to cover the P3, and then I'll wrap up. No, I'm, no she's not. I am. <laughs> thank you. A little confusion here. Um, we're showing you on the next three slides uh, the, the performance uh, uh, objectives for fiscal year 09, and, of course, we have all of our program owners here to answer any questions you might have about those and about fiscal year 08. I won't read them all. I thought I might highlight some of them under our zoning program. Uh, our goal is to complete 75 of the initial plan checks within the target timeline. Um, under design review and historic preservation, uh, our goal is to implement the, implement the Mil Mills Act program and other economic incentives by the end of 2008, and that's going to come back to you shortly. Uh, and uh, the end of 2008, it, as my initial confusion, and you might have it the same, is, of course, uh, in fiscal year 2009. Um, the Housing Rehabilitation Loan Program, uh, as a green goal, we're in incorporating energy saving retrofits in at least 75 percent of all the rehabilitation projects that we do. And under long range planning and special studies and building inspection, uh, our goal is to train one or two staff members in each program in the lead process uh, to attain lead accreditation. And uh, under the City Arts Program, we uh, had a successful um, um, art gallery exhibition this year, and we intend to have another one next year. And the Rental Housing Mediation Task Force, um, Mayor House heard your concern. Just I'll use this opportunity to tell you that we've tried to be as creative as we could and work long and hard to try and find a way to keep that, that program as, as funded to the greatest degree that we could. And our constraints, of course, are those federal limits on the amount of administrative money and um, also uh, human services money that you use or, or, or social services money that you use. And it's predicated on your annual grant plus the amount of program income that you get back every year. And the problem we faced is we're not getting so much money back in repayments because there's fewer uh, loans out there to get the money back from. So, you know, we've, we've gone the whole gamut from supported by the general fund to try to seek uh, funding from organizations outside that might have an interest in what the Rental Housing Mediation Task Force program does. So we'll continue to look at that because we recognize it is a really important program. Thank you very much. And then on the next slide, uh, under building inspection and code enforcement, uh, we intend to respond to 95 percent of code enforcement complaints within five working days and also complete a feasibility study to determine whether the city should assume jurisdiction for mobile homes in the city of Santa Barbara. There's been lots of discussion about that, the, the responsibility of the state and the implications for us if we should take that on. We have a question for Mr. Horton. Um, Dave, on uh, D22. Uh, the top two items, enforcement cases and percent of enforcement cases. I thought we were going to put more emphasis on that, and it doesn't. It shows it flat. Am I looking at the right table? I think we had a big discussion on that point. Oh, regarding the goal of, of achieving 75 percent, and you were looking for a higher number than we, we had. Well, this table here shows 65 I'm looking at D22. Mm -hmm. The first one on yeah. D22. Um, but I, I thought we'd put extra resources in there to pop that up. 
Yes. Thank you. Actually, events have proceeded as since this document was compiled. We've been taking a strong look at this whole enforcement issue. And as I mentioned to you yesterday in the Finance Committee meeting, where, where there's, there's a multi-departmental task force looking at it uh, relative to landscaping and, and, and tree removal and those kinds of things, we're also responding to a lot of, a lot of input that we've gotten recently from uh, members of the APR and others about uh, conformance with lots of other things like, like signage and landscaping, et cetera. So we're, we're working on that. We're looking at the possibility that we may put together some sort of um, multi-department um, section that would address enforcement issues. So we'll be back to you on that. So but no, nothing's definitive of enough. So this table would be out of date at this point. Probably. Well, I think we haven't we haven't fixed on a, a cure for being able to no, do that's, that's a, a higher number. So we're being conservative of what we think we can do, but we're. We're uh, very um, committed to try to make the number turn out to be a lot higher than that. Okay, we have a couple other things here. Um, Ms. Falcone, did you have yours? I did. And thanks. then Ms. Schneider after that. Um, just a quick sentence or two. Could you define for me what you are thinking of when you say determine whether the city should assume jurisdiction? What does assume jurisdiction mean um, to you? I could give you a sentence or two, but I'm going to ask George Australia to come up and give you even a better few sentences about that since he's, he's fully enmeshed in that. that I assume we're going question. to talk about this at some other time, George, but I just, that, I don't know what you're talking Glad about. Glad you came here today, Mr. Stram. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the issue before the city currently is that all mobile, all mobile home um, parks are regulated by the State of California Housing and Community Development. The city in itself has no jurisdiction over these parks. Um, for the past couple of years, you had if you received some updates regarding a mobile home park that was in a really degraded state, and it really took a concerted effort on the part of the city to turn that around. <clears throat> we approached the state, and um, basically they filed a couple of notices of violations, and then turned the case back over to the city to pursue, in which I think we did a, a, a pretty good job in that. The question before us that needs to be answered is, does the city wish to assume jurisdiction of all mobile home parks in the city? It's so what you're talking about is the, um, the maintenance of the roads, the condition of the units in terms of dilapidation or upkeep, the, the, the landscape, the, the physical nature. You're not talking about um, jurisdiction in any way, shape, or form over the actual land, the, the relationship of any kind between the owner of the land and the owner of the, of the mobile unit, uh, any of that. So you're really just looking at code enforcement, jurisdiction yes, to do code enforcement? It would be maintenance. It's primarily code enforcement as okay. these uh, mobile home parks are existing. Uh, if new mobile homes are going in for setup, we would be taking a look at them. It's ongoing maintenance. It is very heavy in the enforcement uh, side of it, including uh, annual inspections that are required to be performed, et cetera. So there's a whole lot of work involved with assuming jurisdiction. And actually, let me add at this point, too, with minimal fees that we would be able to charge. In other words, uh, the state also sets fees that local jurisdictions cannot increase. And those fees are extremely minimal at this point. So that's another area that we're also going to have to uh, analyze. You, you might just in future conversations about this, I know we're going to talk about it somewhere down the road and talking about this is not for today, but when you assume jurisdiction, you're assuming jurisdiction for enforcement. code enforcement. So we might want to yes. be clear about okay. that because otherwise people might get squirrely out there. Thanks. Ms. Schneider. Well, I, I thank Ms. Falcone for that because I got squirrely. Um, I, it was just the way it was phrased given all the sphere of influence conversations we had about mobile home parks and annexation and rent control, and that is nothing that's not even close to what you're talking about. So when um, when we talk about this, we should just be clear that, that's, that we're not talking about that, right? Am uh, I right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, Councilman Falcone, I'll underline that. We are not talking about that. We're really talking about permitting and enforcement. Yeah, it sounds like we're gonna we're gonna need to be real clear with yes. talking about yes. that. Thank okay, you. Thank you. all right. Please continue. Okay, so uh, actually, that's pretty much an overview. I won't read them all, 
Uh, I'm sure you'll have P3 questions for us after we're done, and we're pretty close to done. And I'll move on to some of the highlights of what we've accomplished uh, in, in 2008 and what we intended to do in, intend to do in 2009. I think it's been a good period of time for Plan Santa Barbara. We've done a, a lot of very intensive work on that, worked really closely with the Planning Commission to tweak our process a little bit and get them involved in, and be real players in the Plan Santa Barbara process. Over the last number of months, we had a very successful healthy community forum. I'm sure many of you attended that. And then we had a development trends work session with the Planning Commission, where we really brought them that kind of information about what's happening out there uh, and, and what, what are the implications of that for projecting what future growth is. Where is it happening now? What are the numbers? And then after we provided that uh, information in a development trends report, to the Planning Commission, we took that information to two development trends workshops. I know because I was monitoring your attendance for the Brown Act that all, most of you were there on one or both uh, events that we had. We had a Saturday morning and then we had a Wednesday evening. We got a lot of uh, participation from the public. I thought particularly in the second one, it was really encouraging to see new faces and young faces and more people that came out, possibly in part triggered by the previous evening's discussion of uh, building heights. Uh, in this chambers. Uh, so we got a lot of good uh, feedback on what the community thought about where we ought to go. There's also a youth survey being circulated out there so we can find out the opinions of the you know, uh, youth in our community that are going to be more impacted than uh, most of us uh, for this next period of, of Santa Barbara. And uh, we've been trying to do as much outreach and publicizing what we're doing as possible. And there's been three very good pieces in Inside Santa Barbara, I think one that's uh, running right now, the third one. So that's what's happening in Plan Santa Barbara. Uh, we initiated an impact uh, fee statement that Michelle DeCamp talked to you about earlier. Uh, we uh, got the Architecture 2030 Energy Ordinance approved as a kind of a vanguard effort uh, that the city's doing. Um, we uh, implemented over time based on the NPO process, the single family design guidelines, and uh, developed the sing or put in place and have operating the sim single family design board. Before you leave that slide, I think Ms. Schneider had a. No? Okay, okay. go ahead, please. Um, uh, We've updated in your last budget process in the beginning of 08, end of 07, the Long Range Capital Improvement Program for the Redevelopment Agency. Uh, we responded to the interim ordinance on medical marijuana dispensaries with a medical marijuana ordinance. Uh, we've remodeled the second floor of 630 Garden Street, a parochial concern for us, but a big one. Uh, and we've, we finished that. We're still trying to work out some of the quirks in terms of the furniture, but everything else I think went very smoothly. We were displaced for a number of months uh, and spent, some of us spent time over at 925 De La Vina and some of us spent time in trailers in the back lot. But we're all back in the building and I think it went quite well and I particularly want to compliment Michelle DeCant for being the czar of that whole process and making it go so well. Zarina, yes, pardon me, thank you very much. Good, good correction, thank you. Uh -huh. Yep. Um, and then Brian's been implementing the RD capital projects, and you've assisted us by asking us to add that additional uh, staff position. Uh, we're at the stage of actually uh, uh, scheduling our interviews for filling that position right now. Um, the Ordinance Committee has been reviewing zoning amendments. Uh, we've been doing it in tiers, and we'll continue to T-I-E-R-S, and we'll continue to do it in tiers <laughs> over time till, till we get it all done. Uh, <laughs> um, and then the adoption of the new International Building Codes, uh, that's been completed. Um, efforts for 2009 continue on course with Plan Santa Barbara. Uh, same level of effort, if not more. Um, the Metropolitan Transit District's Lot 3 Transit Village will be coming to you in just a few weeks with a closed session discussion to get guidance for further negotiation with MTD on that project. Uh, Neighborhood Improvement Task Force work program continues to go beautifully and coming up with projects that we can fund with CDBG funds and workforce housing grant funds that we've received in the past from the state. Uh, historic Resources Work Program will be continuing and as we always do, that doesn't even need to be up there, we'll pursue affordable housing opportunities and we've got some good ones out there that we're excited about. Um, and we'll be working on the compatibility criteria for communications between the Historic Landmarks Commission, the Architectural Board of Review, and the Planning Commission. And you've had a session and I think a good, healthy discussion of that. And so we'll be developing those more specific criteria. Uh, the El Pueblo Viejo guidelines as well, moving that forward. 
Uh, and there's, a, as I mentioned earlier, I think today there's a interdepartmental task force being led by Joan Kent to uh, look at our tree and landscape enforcement program and see if we can tighten up. Some of the things that you saw went wrong at 601 East Anapamu, and that was kind of the impetus for us to start looking at all this, and we'll be, we'll be doing that and coming back with some recommendations for change. Again, as always, probably doesn't need to be out th up there. You've signed on to the 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness and hugely important social um, effort that we're undertaking focused on housing first, and uh, we'll just continue to do that. And I will tell you that recently you approved the loan for the Bass Street Project uh, property acquisition that the Housing Authority is doing, and we're looking at uh, the completion or the development review of the project at um, at the Hagen Printing property on Coda Street. Both of those are aimed at that population. Uh, when we have our dialogue with our nonprofit housing developers and the housing authority, our default position is show us what you can do to provide uh, chronic homelessness units. And of course, as you also know, this is all challenged by uh, funding constraints that uh, may be involved in the county budget for uh, services to those kind of projects. So we have to watch that carefully. And then uh, we continue to implement the RDA capital projects, and with the additional help of an additional staff person, we tend to make a lot of progress on those. Uh, again, uh, the different various uh, zoning ordinance amendments will continue to come to the Ordinance Committee. We're looking at lots of regional issues, such as the, right now we're reviewing the uh, land use development plan for the university and the EIR for the university. We're engaged in a, in a vigorous discussion with uh, uh, SVCAG and the other jurisdictions about the allocation of uh, the regional housing needs assessment numbers. Uh, to see what jurisdictions are going to take on what obligations. We'll be back to you uh, in another uh, month or so with the consideration of a, a letter to be issued stating your position to the draft plan. And uh, enforcement priorities. Again, I mentioned the interdepartmental effort and the idea that we might be in some way consolidating the, all the enforcement issues of all the department to be de departments to be determined, but it's something we're looking at to try to increase efficiencies. And I mentioned before the medical marijuana ordinance and the continued implementation of that. And here are uh, current and upcoming projects. I won't read them for you. You can see them. Uh, and you can ask us questions uh, among any of us here about any of those that you have curiosity about. And that really completes our report, and we're ready for your questions. Okay, we have uh, Ms. Schneider. Just one last quick question. When the survey for Plan Santa Barbara comes back, and you're talking about that being an unfunded piece, I know we have a specific fee fund that goes for Plan Santa Barbara, so I'm hoping that the 30000 or whatever it is can come from that as opposed to another general fund allocation. Is, am I correct in assuming that? Or? Betty Weiss will respond to that. Okay. Great. Ms. Weiss. Thank you. Um, we have a, a fee that we collect, and we're repaying a loan from the general fund. And so we will probably look to increase that loan amount to cover this cost because the other contracts that we've already entered into for various support on an economic study and the public outreach, there wasn't a line item for $30,000 to do an opinion poll. Okay. So similar when we went to the Finance Committee to talk about how to fund the additional transportation study and the cost of the EIR, we would go to the Finance Committee and probably talk about bumping up that loan amount again. So eventually it will get paid back to the general fund. Right. That, that would be, item. since that was the latest discussion we had regarding Plan Santa Barbara cost, we're expecting a similar proposal. Great. And I just want to commend how much work is just being done day in, day out. It's pretty amazing. So thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comments from staff? Um, no, uh, Mr. Mayor. We're happy to respond to your questions. All right. I just want to. I just want to say from my side, um, it's amazing seeing how much is going on in the city. I mean, when we have these budget hearings or the capital program reports back, that kind of thing. I mean, uh, the, the, just I'm glad these things. This is televised today, right? <laughs> Hi, mom. Anyway, so I just. <laughs> But I just want to really, you know, appreciate, you know, hope that the public gets a chance to see some of this stuff because it is pretty remarkable what the city is doing and what it's accomplishing. And I think Mr. Davis said something earlier about, you know, you guys are doing some, you know, a lot of work. You know, you're really accomplishing a lot. And I think that the staff just has to be commended for this. 
tremendous effort that keeps this thing going and, and but keeps it progressing, not just holding our own. I and mean, we're, we're moving ahead on these things. So any other comments or questions? Uh, do we need to, agen uh, to uh, adjourn this to another time uh, tonight? I think okay. the meeting's already noticed. Okay, very good. Then uh, we're adjourned. Thank you.